Diana, Princess of Wales, oftentimes called the People's Princess. Born into a wealthy, aristocratic family with strong royal ties, Diana grew up assuming her future would be pretty damn bright. Of course she assumed that. She was raised essentially to be married to someone with royal blood, to be married to a high-born man of means. But she couldn't have known or assumed, dreamt maybe, that she would actually marry the Prince of England, heir to the British throne, and become the British Commonwealth's princess. But that's exactly what happened. She first caught Prince Charles' eye as a teenager when he was, of all things, dating her older sister. What appeared to be a sweet and dreamlike royal romance would begin later, one that would capture the world's attention. Diana seemed to have it all, to be living a fairy tale, a literal prince. The oft-romanticized Prince Charming had picked her. Her foot had fit the fabled glass slipper. And she looked like a fairy tale princess. She was young, elegant, fashionable, beautiful, and now she was an actual princess. But fairy tales don't often actually really come true, do they? Yes, Diana was becoming a princess, but she was not becoming the happy bride of a devoted and love-struck Prince Charming. Their fairy tale romance was fake. From the beginning, a show put on for the cameras to uphold the all-important, picture-perfect, and profitable image of the British royal family. Beneath the facade of their romance, behind the beautiful clothes and jewels and the extravagant wealth was a woman who was sick and suffering. Diana wed a man whose heart and bed already belonged to someone else, someone the king and queen had deemed an unsuitable wife for their prince. Diana's happy, heavily publicized honeymoon was spent largely in tears. She'd married a man who she didn't really love because she didn't really know him, a man who wished he was married to someone else. And now Diana worked hard to hide her true feelings from the media frenzy that surrounded her. She'd sacrificed any hope for a private life once she'd said yes to Prince Charles's marriage proposal. The British media and paparazzi would now watch her every move for the rest of her life, often waiting for her to make a mistake, looking for suspected chinks in the royal family's armor. Diana herself said towards the end of her life, after her marriage had ended, I seem to be on the front of a newspaper every single day, which is an isolating experience. And the higher the media puts you, places you, the bigger the drop. The royal fantasy would end for Diana in divorce, scandal, and shame, which would then bring even more paparazzi into her life. And then her life would end in tragic and controversial fashion. Her death due in large part to the paparazzi she could never seem to get away from. In the early morning hours of August 31st, 1997, when Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris, a car driven by a man trying to escape from the chasing paparazzi. Immediately, Diana became immortalized forever as the people's princess, a mother, a fashion icon, and a beautiful, pure soul corrupted and damaged by the royal family and the media attention that came with being a beautiful and beloved princess. Wild theories immediately began to swirl around her death, many of them hinging on the royal family having her killed because she knew too many of their secrets, or because of their supposed fear that she was going to marry an Egyptian Muslim man, that she might even be pregnant with his child. Today, we explore the life and death of Princess Di, some of the history and inner workings of the British royal family, the family that shaped her life and gave her the fame that led directly to her death, and conspiracies around that followed her death in a royal, rule-breaking, scandalous, and conspiratorial edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master, Suck Nasty, Queen Elizabeth's Adrenochrome Harvester, Todd's Clonade Intern, and you're listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, stay right where you are, Lucifina. Praise good boy Bojangles and glory be to Triple M. We've never needed you more. Big thanks to everyone who came out to the Texas shows. Holy shit, you are spoiling me, making it real easy to return to stand-up. Uh, also, uh, my opener, Mary Santora, killed it. Her new stand-up is so damn good. Uh, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas, such a blast. Didn't even need to look at my set list anymore by the end. I uh, feel like I'm basically back where I was before March 2020 when the last tour came to a, to a halt. Uh, thanks to Matt Bess, Logan Stark, and the rest of the crew at Black Rifle Coffee Company for having me on their podcast, and to Will XX for putting some new ink in my arm while I uh, was on the podcast, while we talked about all sorts of shit. What a good crew they have there in San Antonio. Smart, no bullshit, critical thinking, empathetic, hardworking, America-loving dudes. Uh, inspiring to chat with them. Not sure when that episode will come out. Uh, hoping I had fun in Portland by the time you hear this. Looks like I will. Looking forward to Philadelphia and Columbus, Ohio in September. More dates at dancummins.tv. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook. Now also uh, TikTok. Gotta, gotta be TikToking now. Uh, very cool new uh, Time Suck Horizons tea in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Another awesome designed, uh, design, uh, design from the mind uh, of the Art Warlock for you to check out. Fun seeing Bad Magic gear at the uh, 
the shows as well. Seen it in the wild. And last reminder that our wonderful charity of the month for August is the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. Proud to donate to that cause. Uh, WFFoundation.org to learn more. They're still fighting so many fires. So, so many in the West. Hail Nimrod. Stay safe. And now let's get into some royal blood. But not the awesome uh, hard rock power duo uh, by that name from Brighton. God, those guys are so fucking good. I'm amazed at the amount of sound that can come out of just two guys. Uh, super talented. Love them. Uh, won't be talking about them today. No, we're talking about the, the British royal family. Their, their royal blood, of course. How did the current royal family, Queen Elizabeth and her brood, come to be? How did Lady Diana Spencer become Diana Princess of Wales? Charming the entire world with her beauty, fashion, philanthropy, lovable personality. Let's dive into an overview of who Lady Di was, followed by a, a bit of British royal history, followed by a timeline of Diana's life, and then exploration, exploration of conspiracies that surrounded her death. Henceforth, your majesty, let us commence with some regal and noble sucking. So how did Diana earn her nickname, the People's Princess? Well, by, by winning the hearts of the overwhelming majority of the British public. Most seem to love her still. She was only 36 when she died. She died 24 years ago now, but she's still very popular. Still has immense and worldwide name and image recognition. Still referenced almost daily on the internet for her quotes, her action style, her personality. Part of what made Diana so popular was the optics of what looked like a fairy tale romance with Charles, at least initially. She was young, beautiful, and in a relationship with a cultured older man. Older, but not too old. His balls didn't sag too far down. Still handsome. Not just any man. Royal next in line for the British throne. Of course, this is going to make her popular. This is the real life version of the most popular, right? One of the most popular, probably the most popular, primarily female-centric fantasies of all time. Think about how much the world loves the Prince Charming fantasy. Holy shit. Just look at only the Disney animated films dedicated to a princess finding a prince. Little Mermaid. 233 million in box office earnings when it came out in 1989 based on a, you know, old, I believe, I didn't write this in my notes, it's popping in my head now, but uh, uh, Dutch folklore. And then the home release video along with merchandise sales contributed to The Little Mermaid, uh, quickly generating a total revenue of over a billion dollars. How much has it earned in the years since the early 90s? I don't know, another billion, several more billion. It's, just, it's still extremely popular. Beauty and the Beast made over 440 uh, million at the box office when it came out in 1991 as a Disney remake. Then it was remade again in 2017, and that version quickly generated over $1.2 billion additional dollars. There was the 2015 D Disney Cinderella remake, earning over $542 million just at the box office. On and on and on. Think about all the princess-related merch. Oh, my God. When Monroe was younger, go to the Target or wherever. <laughs> There's just so much princess toys in, in, the, in the toy section. The books, the dolls, the dresses, etc., how much traffic do stories like that drive to Disney theme parks to make billions more? And that's just like the Disney princess stuff and just some of it. For a couple of years growing up, my sister Donna wanted to be a princess. She wear like weird little princess dresses. Of course she did. For a couple of years, my, my daughter, Monroe, wanted to be a princess as well. She dressed up like a, like a princess once to go to Disneyland. I'll, I'll never forget it because she threw a giant fucking tantrum at the gates of Disneyland because I wouldn't let her walk in. I had to take her in the stroller, but she was pretty hilarious to watch a... Uh, a furious prince, a very angry princess. Um, but yeah, princess has to be the most common fantasy for little girls, at least in the Western world, like by far. I've dated women who have actually told me they want to be treated like a princess. I feel like that's a very common quote and a, and a much more common sentiment. At least it was, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, princess aspirations strongly embedded in our culture. Essentially the angle of being a commoner, your average Jane, and then a prince charming comes along and just scoops you up and makes, you know, uh, everything perfect, you know, picks you out of all the women in the world and takes care of your every need forever and ever, happily ever after. Uh, that narrative, even though Diana wasn't really a commoner, got attached to her story, to her life, partially, I think, because so many actual commoners just wanted to see themselves in her story. And I'm not a big fan of this fairy tale. Uh, I didn't push my thoughts on all this to Monroe and ruin her princess phase when she was younger, but I would talk to her about it now, she's 13, if she hadn't already you know, let go of it. I think this fairy tale encourages women to be weak and to long to be taken care of by a man, and it teaches men to look for weak-ass women to be taken care of. Uh, a true lose-lose. Lucifina also not a big fan. She doesn't mind being taken. She doesn't mind being taken care of by a man or being treated like a princess. That that part's fine, but you know, doesn't need it. Wants it to be known she doesn't need that. She can take care of herself if she should show if she should choose. But anyway, the Prince Charming story, probably the most common little girl fantasy. 
maybe just female-centric fantasy in general in the world. Tons of popular princess fairy tales also come from the Middle East, Asia, Africa. Uh, I couldn't find any, you know, quickly uh, in like South America, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some equivalent. In the Western world in modern times, princess fantasies tended to have a British look to them because the British were running more of the world than anyone else. In 1920, the British Empire covered 24% of the Earth's total land area, either directly or through Commonwealth influence. And then there were all the other countries, like the U.S., whose culture directly tied to England and its monarchy. They exported their culture in recent history more successfully than any other nation, by far, that at least uh, that has a monarchy. And because of this, you know, British royal marriages and weddings, princes and princesses, extremely appealing to the international public for centuries. Back in March of 1863, newspapers around the world printed front-page stories about the wedding celebrations of King Edward VII of England and Princess Alexandra of Denmark. Huge crowds lined the streets hoping to get a glimpse of the real-life princess. The 1923 wedding of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, the uh, current Queen Elizabeth's mom, uh, George VI, uh, you know, uh, her Queen, Queen Elizabeth's dad, were also widely publicized, as was Queen Elizabeth's wedding to Prince Philip in 1947. But in the 1940s, media wasn't nearly as internationally pervasive as it, as it would become, you know, in the 1980s. For example, less than 5% of American households had TVs in 1947. Just 7,000 TVs sold that year. Isn't that crazy? Just 7,000. In 1955, million TV sets are sold. And between 10 and 20% of American homes now contain a TV set. By 1978, nearly 75% of American households have a TV. And when Charles and Diana marry on July 29th, 1981, an estimated 750 million to 1 billion people watch on TV. Up to a billion people watch their wedding. It's the most watched wedding in the history of the world, like by far. Time Magazine reported a splendid prince, his beautiful princess, a carriage, a crowd, fantasy come to life, a dream riding in stately progress through London. Except this moment and the ones that came before and after were real for all to observe. Diana became the first English woman to marry the heir apparent, first in line to the throne in 300 years. Previous brides had long been from other nations. And England fell in love with one of their own. Just fuck yeah, bro. She's one of us. Uh, and she seemed more like one of, you know, one of their own in the, uh, the, compared to a lot of other royals. She was modern, seemed kind, came across as down to earth and approachable. She didn't seem stiff and unapproachable like Queen Elizabeth and many other royals. She gave off less of a blue blood, reptilian shapeshifter, adrenochrome harvester vibe, if you're a longtime sucker and current on your conspiracy lore. She basically immediately became much more popular than her husband, uh, who seemed stiff and aloof. The popularity discrepancy would quickly cause problems in their marriage, actually. Charles, well aware that the people preferred his wife to him. And that was not the power dynamic he'd hoped for. Uh, overall, though, the royal family uh, loved the attention initially shed on Diana. They saw her as the, the perfect princess initially. Uh, the royal family, you know, viewed her as a wonderful public image asset. And public image, this is so important today, huge for the royals in modern times. It's fucking everything for them. The Prince Charming stuff, uh, all those Disney movies and more, great for royal business. Keeping a high and regal profile is what keeps the British monarchy afloat. The position they now hold in British culture is so interesting to me. They haven't had any real political power in roughly two centuries. And their power has been waning, actually, for centuries before that. It's 99.9% .9 symbolic now. The king or queen is still technically the head of the state or head of state in the UK, but in name only. The prime minister runs the government, an elected official. The prime minister is a voted member of the House of Commons. The House of Commons is where legislation actually gets uh, legislated. The monarch privately advises the prime minister to some degree, but the prime minister doesn't actually have to listen to them. That's a, doesn't have to take their advice. You know, legislation passed by a body of voted in representatives, not by a monarch, uh, not by other nobility. One of the crown's most important responsibilities now is to be uh, the official patron of over 600 charities. And that is very cool. But even this role, you know, it's just about drawing attention to these charities, not actually deciding how to run them, how to fund them with state money uh, or to even donate to them. Just to show up and, you know, uh, bring some attention to them. Show up at a, at, a, at a gallery opening. You know, make a statement. Most of the royal family's income today is totally dependent essentially on tourism. Tourism driven by the image of being royal. They're a distant echo of what they used to be. A variety of properties collectively referred to as the Crown Estate, such as Buckingham Palace, charge tourists to enter and explore them. They sell stuff in their gift shops, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the biggest money makers the past two years has been a variety of royal-only fan accounts. Uh, Prince Charles, Prince William, Kate Middleton, definitely Kate Middleton, uh, Queen Elizabeth, the others, they all have OnlyFans, adult content accounts, aka they monetize nude pics, bathroom mirror selfies, gonzo porn, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, I just read an article about how Queen Elizabeth sold more worn panties online in 2020 than anyone else in the world. It's fucking crazy. Prince Philip, before he died, made and sold his 37th annual fully nude calendar. Um, heavy on the dick. Uh, you can still pick it up at Walmart, Target, other retailers. And uh, no, you can't. That's fucking crazy. No, they don't, they don't have OnlyFans accounts or sell panties or calendars. But their income is almost entirely dependent on their popularity. I wish there was calendars like that out of there just for the humor angle. Uh, if people lost interest in the royal family, they would truly cease to exist as a royal family. Right, the English public would just cry for them to uh, have to abdicate the throne, and they'd pass new legislation, and they would just be gone. Like so, so they have a lot of financial interest in upholding a certain image of keeping the royal fairy tale very much alive. So again, Queen Elizabeth, her husband Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, others, you now they were ecstatic regarding the attention showered on Prince Charles and Lady Diana's wedding, and then they were greatly and pleasantly surprised by the attention that continued to flow in afterwards. This was new and very much unexpected. Throughout royal family history, after a wedding took place, you know, the attention typically died down substantially. Not this time. Not during the TV age. And not with Diana. The paparazzi and newspapers, right, with all the tabloids now, constantly tried to photograph her. And tabloids are fucking huge in the UK. Uh, Much more, uh, much bigger than in America, if you didn't know. Uh, Like these daily tabloids. Uh, The paparazzi and newspapers constantly tried to photograph her because her image, you know, just sold more papers. In addition to being a princess, she was gorgeous. She'd make a lot of lists of the world's most beautiful people. Beautiful princess who actually looked like a fairy tale version of a princess. Nice. That sold papers. That sold stories. And then later when the press figured out her relationship with Charles was a sham, when scandals began to appear, oh, wow. Well, those stories, they sold even better. Negative news. Always seems to beat out positive news, doesn't it? And this negative news was not the attention the royal family wanted. Not the fairy tale they're, they're trying to project. The royals had no interest in the scandals the tabloids loved. Tabloids loved a scandal so much, if one wasn't actually happening, right, they'd just create one. That's been their business model for a long time. They created one with the first, uh, or the first one with Diana in February of 1982, less than a year into her marriage. The paparazzi followed her and Charles to the Bahamas and photographed her with a bikini. She was pregnant with Prince William at the time. And Queen Elizabeth was furious. She called it the blackest day in the history of British journalism. And Queen Elizabeth is uh, a bit dramatic. Blackest day? And uh, I would think they count uh, fallen soldiers during World War I or World War II. Might have trumped Diana being, uh, you know, photographed in a bikini, but whatever. Uh, the queen actually held an emergency meeting at the palace with British newspaper editors after these pics were leaked. And she ordered them to give Diana her privacy. But they did not listen because nobody really fucking cares what she thinks. She doesn't actually hold any real power. I love this. How odd, right? What a, what a weird role the British royals currently play. Such an odd bit of public theater. Their main job is just to act royal. Whatever the fuck that means. Just go be part of some ribbon cutting ceremonies, uh, speak kindly of some charities, uh, hug some suffering kids, show up at some traditional events and say the traditional things. The Queen of England has more in common in many ways with a mall Santa than an actual world leader now. She's a nostalgic symbol, a living relic. She's a pretend monarch, a bit of living cultural glue that helps bind the present to the past and remind the people of the Commonwealth how powerful the British Empire once was. So odd. Queen Elizabeth is like the Pope. If no one in the Catholic Church actually gave a fuck what the Pope thought. <laughs> if the Pope had zero say over church affairs. Right? She's arguably more similar to a person paid to pay the, play the part of a princess at Disney World than to an actual queen of old. And in moments, like when she calls this emergency meeting and demands people listen to her, it, it feels like she's not entirely aware of the limits of her current role. God, I wish a transcript existed of that meeting. You shall not print another image or run another story without my express consent. As your queen, I command that this decree be punished by death for those who do not follow it. And someone's just like, "Uh, no, thank you, your majesty. We're going to uh, do as we please and run some more bikini pics. Thank you very much. Why, Rupert Murdoch, how dare you defy me? Who do you think you are? I think I'm someone much more powerful than yourself, your majesty. Son makes a lot of money running those bikini pics. I came here not to apologize, but to make an offer. To buy some nudes of Diana, and if you're game, maybe some younger titty pics of yourself that you may be hiding. How dare you! Guards, arrest this filthy miscreant! I'm sorry, your majesty, but while very rude, Mr. Murdoch's broken no laws. Well, at least take him away from me. I don't want him in my sight. I'm sorry, your majesty, but he has a meeting with the prime minister in the same room in five minutes. He's asked you not to be a part of it, so I'm afraid I must escort you and your silly little crown out of the room very shortly. (gasps) Oh! Back to the precious royal image now. Uh, The royal family has a long list of rules and protocols that are expected to be followed in public and private. Think think going to a nice restaurant and being expected to know exactly which fork to use for which course. Times 10,000. So many fucking rules. So much protocol. 
Diana would soon become notorious for breaking these rules, which endeared her to the general public, but did not endear her to Queen Mummy, to the royal family. Uh, For example, Diana chose her own engagement ring from, wait for it, a catalog. Like some common street strumpet, it's wah-wah. Easy Bojangles. Stop whimpering, good boy. I know it's upsetting. Uh, Royal rings were typically, you know, custom made. But Diana wanted, uh, you know, a different kind of ring. She wanted one that she'd already seen in the House of Draud in their jewelry collection catalog. And they are one of the crown jewelers, but she didn't want one of their custom ones. She was like, no, that one's cool. She chose a ring that was accessible to the public. Some common peasant could buy it. This This displeased the royal family because they like to project a much more unattainable image, right? They could get jewelry that was inaccessible. To the, to the general public. They were above the common hordes. They were better than you. And that's why you paid to come see their properties. That's why it meant something when they showed up at the unveiling of some new important public work or whatnot. You're being blessed by the presence of royalty. Not some fucking lady from down the street who wore the same ring you did. They didn't want a royals. They're just like you image. Uh-uh. And I feel like this mindset makes more sense to British citizens than it does to Americans. We haven't had social classes in the States like those that have existed to various degrees in the UK for over a millennium. We don't have a house of lords. We don't have dukes and duchesses, earls and countesses, viscounts and viscountesses, barons and baronesses, etc. The British royals are still a powerful upper class in British society. The British aristocracy has far, far less political power than it once did, basically none. Uh, They can't stop bills from becoming laws anymore uh, like they, you know, still could as recently as 1911. Now they can just delay them. But they do own more than a third of all British land still. Yes, over 33% still in the hands of the aristocrats and traditional landed gentry. So that gives them a lot of cultural weight and financial power. Still a lot of social cachet in being a lord or lady. It means in all likelihood you grew up in wealth and privilege. Your family owns a lot of valuable land. Your bloodline can be traced back to kings and queens, if not in England, somewhere else in Europe. It means your social circle is full of other royalty and artists, politicians, industry leaders, etc. That that's, you know, the people that that circle attracts. Maybe the closest thing to royalty we've ever had in the U.S. has been the Kennedy family. But their fame and prestige has been waning, I would say, for the past few decades quite a bit. Currently, this might sound weird, I think the Kardashians (laughs) are the closest thing we have in America to British nobility, which is really fucking sad. A a family famous now primarily for just being famous. A family you expect to take the most luxurious vacations, live in decadent and uh, unattainable homes, drive the most expensive cars, wear the biggest jewels, custom jewelry, date other celebrities, Etc. Like being a Kardashian carries an association now with like a life of luxury. And just like we have been culturally fascinated with the Kardashians for years now, as far as tabloid coverage goes or that type of coverage, the British public has long been fascinated with the royals. So anyway, Diana got what Queen Elizabeth considered a basic white bitch wedding ring. And then she wrote her own vows and refused to say that she would obey Prince Charles. Egad, what is happening? Diana then became the first British royal to give birth to a future monarch outside of a castle. She gave birth to both children at St. Mary's Hospital in 1982 and 1984. Gross. And she did, you know, other, what the fuck was she thinking, rebellious shit, like naming her children. And she actively participated in child rearing. Like she played with her kids, you guys. She sat down on the floor and she played with them like a common peasant. And please make sure you're sitting down when you listen to this next part. I don't want anyone hurting themselves if they faint. (sighs) She breastfed them. I feel lightheaded. Historically, royal babies don't get to suckle upon royal mummies, royal titties. The blue blood tatas off limits. Why is that? Well, in a word, body piercing. So I guess that's two words. Historically, British royal women have had their nipples pierced and uh, that can interfere with breastfeeding. British royal women, when they turn 18, expected to have a golden ring put through each nipple, nipple adorned with whatever jewel is associated with their royal house. Queen Elizabeth, for example, has two five carat emeralds hanging under each of her nipples. She also has clit jewelry. She has a clit clip with a 15 karat diamond from what I understand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Of course that's nonsense. It just really makes me laugh when I think about it. The thought of Queen Elizabeth <laughs> wearing a jeweled clit clip is so ridiculous to me. Especially when I think of her not having like a tiny clip, but like a fucking rock, like a giant rock of a diamond down there. I wasn't kidding about the no breastfeeding part though. Historically, British noble women had wet nurses. Uh, feed their babies so they can more quickly, you know, resume noble duties. And because, you know, having a baby in your tit, well, that's common folk shit. Peasant titties are for babies. Royal titties are for, I don't know, ribbon cutting ceremonies or something. I'm not sure exactly. Maybe for noblemen to suckle upon while they pretend to be babies since they have mommy issues because they were often sent away to boarding schools for the entirety of their childhoods. I, I don't know what royal titties are for. Diana also sent her children to public school instead of educating them with a private governess. My God. 
They could, they could have, you know, gotten common folk lice or scabies. What a terrible mother. William was the first heir to the British throne to ever attend uh, public school. As a young child, the Jane, like a uh, preschool, the minor, the Jane Miners Nursery School near Kensington Palace. And while it's, while it's called a public school, this is not exactly some y, YMCA program. Uh, public in the sense that anyone can theoretically send their kids there if they have tuition money. It costs around 850 pounds a year when preschool Prince William went there. And that was when the prime minister made around 45,000 pounds a year. So cheaper than some other private schools for sure, but still spending. And, and it wasn't a governess. And that's what Queen Elizabeth expected. That's what the queen mommy wanted. All of this illustrates that Diana was unconventional. She was an unconventional mother by royal standards. Her children also ate fast food, right? McDonald's, they rode pe- public transportation. My God. Uh, I mean, you know, with a security detail and just occasionally for show, but they wore like jeans and baseball caps. They went whitewater rafting, rode bikes. Diana made them wait in line at Disney. You know, with surrounded by security detail, like a, like a common plea, kind of. Uh, she also got down on their level when speaking to them, something no royal had ever done in public. Her stiff upper lip was not nearly as stiff as the majority of the royal family wanted. She's famous for saying, if someone might be nervous of you, or if you're speaking to a very young child or sick person, get yourself on their level. Uh, interesting that that was like an original thought for her within the royal family. Like, others were like, hmm, I don't like it. Uh, Diana also frequently sh- uh, showed off her shoulders. Ugh. She wore tight dresses. Harlot, strumpet, trollop, hussy, floozy. Other synonyms for harlot. Uh, she also liked to wear black, a color typically reserved for funerals, uh, to places where no one died. You know, Diana didn't wear gloves to formal events, uh, didn't wear nude nail polish like the queen preferred. Uh, weird that Queen Elizabeth is weighing in on nail polish colors. But again, image so important to their bottom line. Uh, she wore bold makeup. She even wore pantsuits. Ugh! She should have just set fire to Buckingham Palace while she was up to all this other cultural sabotage. Much to the frustration and embarrassment of the royal family, Diana's rule-breaking only made Britain love her more. Not only did people in the UK fall for her, the whole world was obsessed with Diana. Anywhere she went, uh, she seemed happy to be there, wanted to talk to people in the crowds. She was, she was more famous than members of the Beatles at the height of their fame and didn't even have to learn an instrument. Just had to be friendly and approachable and beautiful, break a few, few rules, and be married to a prince. In the late 80s, early 90s, Diana's popularity soared even more when she became more of an activist and philanthropist uh, this wasn't anything new for the royal family, but, it, but Diana seemed to throw a lot more passion into her support of various causes. And her actions were much more widely publicized than anyone before her. Her presence helped out charities immensely because of that coverage. Uh, one famous photo of her depicts her hugging a seven-year-old boy diagnosed with AIDS. This was at the height of the AIDS epidemic. An immediate spike in donations to AIDS-related causes followed this photo's release. Stigma regarding AIDS noticeably lessened after this. She broke barriers during a time when people thought that just touching uh, uh, alone could transmit that disease. Diana's charity work included leprosy, domestic violence, AIDS, mental health. And the queen didn't like that shit either. She felt that these charities came across as a little too depressing, a little too gritty and dirty. She wanted Lady Di to spend her philanthropo- or, or, you know, philanthropic time working for happier, lighter causes. It didn't involve her taking photos with, you know, mutilated bodies and dying kids. Uh, Diana, why must you spend your days touching so many pale children? And, and not the good, pale, noble-blooded kind. The bad pale. Might, might throw blood or cry in your expensive blouse kind. Why can't you support a charity for, say, uh, buying aristocratic children new riding gear to use at boarding school so they don't have to carry the dreadful stuff from home and bring it in and out of their limos? Uh, the more I read about Lady Di's that life or read about it, the harder it became not to really dislike Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Lady Di at one point was president or patron of over a hundred charities. Another one that drew the ire of the royal family uh, was her work with organizations dedicated to both dismantling landmines and also no longer using them in battles going forward. On January 15th, 1997, uh, Diana put on protective gear, walked across a landmine field in Huambo, Angola. Uh, She drew attention to the issue of banning landmines around the world. Her actions helped propel the United Nations Mine Ban Treaty, and the royal family did not like this because they felt her actions were too political, possibly divisive, felt the princess shouldn't be seen putting on military gear and walking into a war zone. And of course, the public loved her still more for this. So much of what she did, loved by the public, disliked by the royal family. In 1995, she gave a BBC interview where she openly spoke about her marriage troubles, affairs, poor treatment at the palace. This was a huge blow to the royal image. Their popularity dropped in these polls they would always do, still do. Uh, She was also uh, open about her struggles with depression, bulimia, self-harm. Her interview drew back the curtains, hiding the dark secrets of the royal family, turned public opinion against the rest of the monarchy and in favor of Diana. And when Diana died, the public was devastated to lose their princess. In death, she then took on a saint-like image, revered even more. 
And after her death, Prime Minister Tony Blair called her the people's princess in a touching speech. Diana said she wanted to be queen of people's hearts, something she accomplished in spades. Uh, to this day, every year on the anniversary of her death, people pay tribute to the princess they grew up with and adored. And we will get to know this princess in more detail in today's timeline after we spend some time better understanding the British royal family she was a part of. The British monarchy has reigned, kind of, for well over a thousand years. And I say kind of because, you know, for the last two centuries, they've reigned only in name. The first king of England was Athelstan of the House of Wessex, grandson of Alfred the Great, king of the West Saxons, then king of the Anglo-Saxons. Athelstan is the uh, 30th great-granduncle of Queen Elizabeth. And he defeated the last Viking invaders and consolidated Britain into a unified country, then ruled from 929 to 939 CE. In the 11th century, the Normans took over Britain via Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror. He would reign from 1066 to 1087. And every English monarch who has followed William, including Queen Elizabeth II, is considered a descendant of the Norman-born king. She is the 27 time, you know, times great-granddaughter of King William. According to some genealogists, actually more than 25% of the English population distantly related to him, as are countless Americans with British ancestry. Dude had at least nine kids, maybe 10, who went on to have lots of kids themselves, and so on and so on. From the time of William the Conqueror, a.k.a. William the Bastard, all the way until 1702, the crown was passed down to the firstborn son. Then in 1702, Parliament passed the Act of Settlement. The Act declared that when William III died, the title would pass down to Anne and the heirs of her body. For the first time, a woman could inherit the throne as long as there wasn't a male heir to take her place. And that rule wouldn't change until 2013, when the Succession to the Crown Act was passed, and it shifted the line of succession to the firstborn heir, regardless of gender. And that's very nice and fair and right, but also who fucking cares, since the monarch has no real power. And again, it's the right thing to do, but just would have meant more, you know, if it would have happened a few centuries earlier. Uh, interestingly, as the power of the crown is, it began to wane politically, beginning way back in 1215, actually, with the Magna Carta, which basically stopped the king from just doing whatever the fuck the king wanted to do to his nobles and peasants. Not everyone had, you know, now everyone had rights, and he couldn't just whimsically lop their heads off. And some of that would still go on, but, you know, had to go through some fucking rigmarole, and, you know, d uh, dog and pony show to get it done. Uh, as the power waned, image became more and more important. If they didn't have as much real power, you know, they wanted to hold on as firmly as possible to the illusion of power. And that led to the passage of the Royal Marriages Act of 1772. It prescribed the conditions under which members of the royal family could contract a valid marriage in order to guard against marriages that would diminish the status of the royal house. Can't diminish the status of their mascots. For the next 250 years, commoner marriages were almost non-existent. Prince Charles would be the first heir to the throne to marry a commoner in two and a half centuries when he married Diana. The public loved Diana for technically being a commoner. She's one of us. But she was commoner in title only. She was raised as a royal and really, she absolutely was a royal. I'll make that clear in the timeline. She was not the daughter of a coal miner working at a gas station or something when Prince Charles met her, right? Uh, when, you know, when he met her, she wasn't exactly wearing like a, like a motorhead tank top, scratching a new English rose tattoo on the top of her tit, you know, with long fake nails. Asked him if, she, if he needed some matches to go along with his pack of squares. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, the current royal family is now known as the House of Windsor. They succeeded the House of Hanover when Queen Victoria died on January 22nd, 1901. The Windsor monarchs include Edward VII, George V, Edward VIII, George VI, Elizabeth II. Uh, been the queen since 1952. Longest reigning monarch ever by six years and counting. She just will not die! Uh, the current heir, of course, Elizabeth's son, Charles, Prince of Wales. Charles uh, uh, is uh, he and Diana's son, Prince William, Duke of Cambridge. Prince Charles, the longest heir apparent in British royal history. Queen Elizabeth, 95 years young. How does she do it? Well, in a word, adrenochrome. It's all that Illuminati adrenochrome she's drinking, right? If you read enough stuff online. And her exceptionally long reign uh, does bring me to our first sponsor. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Whipple. Royal Adrenochrome Edition. Did you know that Queen Elizabeth is a lot older than 95? Try 9,500, you fucking idiot. She's been living underground for almost 10,000 years, waiting for her turn to rule with the other reptilians inside the Hollow Earth. And what do those lizard foes drink? Adrenochrome! And now also, Whipple Adrenochrome Edition. For the first time in history, the adrenal fluid of tortured children is being mass marketed and available for public purchase. Every 48 ounce can of Whipple Adrenochrome Edition, packed with 15 grams of methamphetamines, 75 times the normal dose, 50,000 milligrams of caffeine, 6 full ounces of MCT oil, 8 ounces of pure, unadulterated children's adrenochrome, harvested directly from underground Illuminati torture facilities. And with new flavors like Royal Peach Panties and Blueberry Blue Blood, fear has never tasted so good. 
Drink enough Whipple Adrenochrome Edition and your skin will turn to scales. Your tailbone will sprout a tail and your cold black heart will beat forever! Fuck you! Fuck your family! And drink Whipple! Please note that availability will vary based on your location since Whipple Adrenochrome Edition is illegal as fuck everywhere other than Portugal and the Netherlands. Huh. If you're a new listener, uh, don't, even, don't even worry about that. You never, you never heard that. Just forget about it. Forget, forget about it. Let's get back to the narrative. Gosh dang. Uh, Queen Elizabeth is part of the House of, uh, is part of the House of Windsor. <laughs> the House of Windsor hasn't accomplished much as far as uh, rulers go. Again, because they never really ruled. Uh, they've only had ceremonial roles and go- roles in government. After the Parliament Act was passed in 1911, like I mentioned earlier, the House of Lords lost uh, the last real political power they had: the ability to veto legislation. Now, now they can only delay it, which is funny to me. Now they can just be like, I, I don't like it. And then the House of Commons, 650 actual elected officials can be like, we don't fucking care. All right, then. C- uh, carry on. Uh, <laughs> during Elizabeth's reign, there's actually been talk at numerous points of abolishing the monarchy altogether. Beginning in the late 1960s, British polls during that time revealed that a majority of people believed that the monarchy was an out-of-touch anachronism, a needless and useless relic of a bygone era. To try and improve their image, the royal family participated in a 1969 TV documentary titled Royal Family to open up more to the public. And the response was divided. Uh, Ever since, there have been occasional grumblings calling for the monarchy to be abolished, have them abdicate the throne. If that ever happened, the Windsor family would lose a lot of their assets. Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, they don't actually own a lot of these properties anymore. They're uh, owned by a trust of sorts. And should the royal family ever lose the royal titles, ownership of those properties would revert to the state. Queen Elizabeth does privately still own a lot of land, though, such as uh, uh, Bal- Balmoral, Balmoral Castle in the Scottish Highlands, uh, in the Scottish Highlands, and uh, Sandrinum Estate in Norfolk. So uh, she's going to be fine. She and her, whoever's in her will, is gonna, are going to be fine if that happens. Uh, they would rather not lose their titles, though. Uh, rather not lose a lot of their assets. And one way they could do that would be through too many scandals, right? If they became a bunch of rude, trashy folks, showed up for official duties in sweatpants and Crocs, and graphic t-shirts with like three wolves howling at the moon on them, if they burped and scratched their asses during public speeches, if they pissed on the lawn of Buckingham Palace or flashed their pierced tits around Winter Castle, and not just on their OnlyFans accounts <laughs> that they don't have, uh, they would very likely be abolished. Uh, realizing uh, that my OnlyFans accounts uh, jokes may not last very long. <laughs> may be incredibly dated in a month or so after this episode drops. If, they, if, they, if OnlyFans goes through that adult content ban, they've been taking a lot of heat online for proposing. Really seem to be turning their back on the horse they rode in on, so to speak. Uh, anyway, when Queen Elizabeth worries about what Lady Diana is saying or doing, some of that concern is actually very valid in the uh, interest of self-preservation, this, despite it making her seem pretty hateable sometimes. They're hanging on by a fucking thread over there. Appearances are everything for them now, and Queen Elizabeth did not care for the appearance Diana often projected. Okay, now that we've laid out some cultural context and historical background for today's tale and its star, let's really dive into the details of Diana's life her marriage with Charles, and her tragic death in today's timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time-suck timeline. On November 14th, 1948, Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is born at Buckingham Palace. Prince Charles will go on to become the longest monarch in waiting in British history. Dude, still waiting. His immortal lizard mom just won't die. She just keeps drinking that whipple. Uh, Charles will soon have three younger siblings. Princess Anne will be born August 15th, 1950. Prince Andrew born February 19th, 1960. Prince Edward born March 10th, 1964. Uh, Prince Andrew, if his name sounds more familiar than Anne or Edward, is because his name was tied to the Jeffrey Epstein uh, underage masseuses, escort sexual abuse scandal. Prominent Epstein accuser, Virginia Jufre has sued him over allegations of rape and sexual abuse when she was only 17. He's been away from, you know, royal public duties for almost two years now because of links to his old party buddy, Epstein. Two were friends for over a decade at least. Queen Elizabeth not pleased with baby boy Andy's bullshit. That's why he remains in royal timeout. And he used to be known uh, more for being married to another beloved royal, Fergie, a.k.a. Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York. She was my tabloid favorite as a kid, simply because, just being totally honest, I just thought she was super fucking hot. I knew nothing about her other than she was a sexy redhead. I still think she was a very sexy redhead. Hail, Lucifina. Uh, Fergie and Andrew had a heavily public- publicized divorce. The tabloids loved it. The queen, again, did not. Her two oldest boys bringing her so much disappointment. If she could remain married to Prince Philip for 73 years until his death, a man who looked a lot like Skeletor from He-Man for the last 30 years or so of his life, why couldn't they keep it together? 
Her baby boy, Prince Edward, Earl of Wessex, he has kept a pretty low profile. Mainly does philanthropic work now. Mummy probably loves him the best. Uh, only daughter Anne, the princess royal, 16th in line to the throne. That doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, she has also been divorced. Ugh, yeek. Other than that, though, no real scandals. The princess royal has been referred to as the royal family's trustiest anchor. Beacon of good old-fashioned public service, having carried out over 20,000 engagements related to public service since her 18th birthday. Uh, she also at one time would date Andrew Parker Bowles, or Bowles, uh, Bowles, uh, I think, uh, the man who would marry the, uh, the, the woman Prince Charles loved and cheated on Diana with, Camilla Shand, later Camilla Bowles, now Camilla Duchess of Cornwall. I don't know why I'm hesitant on her name now. I had it in my head earlier. Now, now I can't decide if it's Bowles or Bowles. I want to say Bowles because Bowles well, doesn't have a great connotation. Um, married to Prince Charles since uh, 2005. So that's a quick overview of Charles and his siblings. On February 6, 1952, Charles's grandfather, George VI, passes away, the king. His mother now becomes queen, which means at the age of three, Charles became heir to the British throne, and he's been waiting ever since because mother refuses to die. Must I put a head on, on your head on a stick to become king mother? Uh, Charles took on the title of Duke of Cornwall under a charter of King Edward III from 1337. In the Scottish peerage system, he takes on the titles Duke of Rosse, Earl of Carrick, Baron Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, <laughs> and Prince and Great Steward of Scotland. All these fucking titles. So many of them for so many of these royals, all left over from so many marriages between royals, so many bloodlines to keep track of to see who's heir to fucking which thing, the Duke of this, the Countess of that, just a bunch of political shenanigans. The monarch, you know, can just bestow honorary titles as time goes on as well. England, there's so many peerage systems for these titles. England, England, excuse me, has its own peerage system. And, th and that's, uh, those are titles created before 1707. And then Great Britain has a peerage system. And that's titles created between 1707 and 1801. Scotland has a peerage uh, system. Titles created before 1707 as well. Ireland has one. Mostly titles created before 1801, but some new ones. And then the UK overall has one. And those are titles created since 1801. So many titles. It is absurd at this point. It just creates a, a shit ton of confusing public like Ancestry.com proof of lineage bullshit that almost no one fucking cares about anymore. At least no one outside of the UK. Uh, on June 2nd, 1953, Queen Elizabeth is officially coronated as pretend ruler of England. Charles is four. He has a governess until the age of eight. At that point, his parents decide he should go to a private school instead of having a personal tutor at the palace. And this is a, a tiny bit scandalous. Uh, weird that Queen Elizabeth would later get mad at Diana for putting her kids in school. When she did the same thing, just not quite as young, because that was new. Charles would be the first ever heir apparent to attend school with non-royals at the age of eight or older. On November 7th, 1956, Charles started attending Hill House School in West London. Makes me think of that haunting of Hill House show on Netflix, which I love. Uh, he ended up playing soccer, encouraged by the headmaster, who said on the soccer field he would not be treated like a prince. Just go out there and be like just any other boy. Uh, September of 1957, Charles is sent to a boarding school at, uh, it's called the Cheam School, Preparatory School in uh, Headley, over 20 miles from London, shipped away so young, not even quite nine when he started going there. His father, Prince Philip, had attended the same school. Doesn't that feel super young? I mean, one thing, if your parents don't have the means to raise you full-time, for some reason, they need to ship you away since uh, they can't like work and raise you or something, or make sense if you have special needs or behavioral problems, perhaps. But here, like when you have parents that do have the time to raise you, uh, time to support you, and, and then they still ship you off. I mean, it's a very prestigious school, but it just seems so cold to me. I feel like that's going to fuck you up a bit emotionally. Uh, 1958, Queen Elizabeth titles her son Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester. Gets, give, gives it some more time. He didn't have enough titles. Uh, God, look at that poor little sh schlub. He's only got like 17 titles. That's why he cries all the time. Got to give him a couple more titles. He's now nine years old. Uh, July 1st, 1961, Diana Spencer is born at Park House in San Sandringham, Norfolk. Her full title at birth is the Honorable Diana Frances Spencer. She's not one of the common folk. Her, her dad is Edward John Spencer, Viscount Althorpe. Viscount uh, is a courtesy title here, given to a titleless member of the nobility, but uh, when his father died, so when Diana's grandfather died, her dad becomes Earl Spencer, which is a hereditary title. Now he now, he now is a member of the House of Lords. Uh, Edward was very close to the royal family as well, serving as an uh, equerry, basically a royal squire in charge of making sure other people are taking great care of the king and queen's fancy uh, stable of horses. Uh, Diana's mother was Francis Ruth Burke Roche, uh, Viscountess Althorpe, and daughter of a baron. 
She was a confidant of the current Queen Elizabeth's mother, Queen Elizabeth I, the current queen, and, you know, Queen Elizabeth II. Both Diana's parents extremely friendly with the king and queen. Uh, Diana's parents married in June 1954. Uh, the queen and Prince Philip attended. Uh, the Spencers leased Park House then, part of Queen Elizabeth's estate, a big noble home, one of several, on the luxurious 20,000-acre Sandringham Estate. Queen Elizabeth has spent holidays and up to two months a year at this estate for her entire life. Her, her father died at this estate. He loved it. Uh, growing up, Diana played with Charles's younger siblings, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward. The Spencer family not only lived on a very, on very exclusive royal land, a big level up from a gated community, they were also wealthy, uh, very wealthy themselves, thanks to centuries of profitable sheep farming and wool trading. An ancestor acquired an, an aristocratic title from James I in 1603. Uh, in 1765, a Spencer was granted an earldom. Diana's ancestors went on to become some of the Knights of the Garter, uh, privy counselors, uh, a first lord of the admiralty. She was also related to Charles II and James II through illegitimate relationships. Her family once helped install King George I on the throne in the 1700s. According to Diana's, to Diana's friend Rose Monckton, whenever she was feeling down, Diana would tell herself, remember, you're a Spencer. Like her family's name held power and prestige. Not a commoner. Only technically a commoner because she was not born a Duke, Marquess, Earl, Viscount, or Baron. Or I guess, you know, Baroness. However, she was an aristocrat from an extremely wealthy family. Right? She was directly related to people who did hold these titles. And I think I keep beating that drum because, um, you know, uh, only being casually familiar with her growing up, I just assumed that she was some commoner because the press loved to sell that narrative because it fit the beloved fairy tale. Uh, during the holidays, the Spencer children were sent to visit the royals and do things like watch Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and their private theater on their estate. Sounds fucking awesome. Growing up in Park House, Diana had a governess, a house cook, a butler. All the staff had their own private cottages uh, on the massive property. And her family had massive property elsewhere as well that I'll get into in a little bit. Like, it's crazy how big some of these estates are. Diana had two older sisters, one younger brother, Lady Jane Fellows, Lady Sarah McCorkadale, and Charles Spencer, Ninth Earl Spencer. Sarah was born in 1955, Jane in 1957, and then Charles, you know, a little bit later, 1964. Uh, Diana, while growing up with money and privilege, uh, she did not grow up in a happy home. Her parents argued, fought often, would separate in 1967. One of Diana's earliest childhood memories was of her hiding behind a door and watching her father slap her mother across the face. Why they didn't get along is uncertain. Diana and her siblings could never ask their parents about the problems. They remember their mother often crying. They constantly had new nannies. So what's going on there? The stream of nannies, domestic turmoil brought a fair amount of instability to Diana's life. She never had a constant support system. Additionally, eating disorders ran in the family. Diana's sister, Sarah, would suffer from anorexia. Diana would experience severe bulimia growing up. Not a great social class to be born into and also have uh, some kind of body dysmorphic you know, eating disorder, I imagine. I wonder how, uh, you know, being born into a noble family, like how much it fed into developing anorexia and bulimia. I mean, the pressure to look picture perfect had to have been immense. You're expected to look a certain way, uphold your noble family name. You got to be beautiful, have perfect manners, have a slim figure, no wrinkles in your clothes, no scuffs on your shoes, dress fashionably, but not too fashionably, look attractive, but not overtly sexual. Lady Di and her sisters expected to fit inside a very narrow little box. I fucking hate that. The money would not be worth it to me if I had to become a slave to that royal image. Uh, backing up a bit to reconnect with Charles now, since his story is obviously so, uh, so tied to hers. In April of 1962, the prince turns 13 and begins his first term at Gordonston, a boarding school way up in Scotland. And another school his father had attended before him must carry on the royal legacy. Four years later, 1966, Charles spends six months as an exchange student at Timbertop, a remote outpost of the Geelong Church of England Grammar School in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, seven years later, 1973, he'd say, he'd say his uh, time at Timbertop was the most enjoyable part of his whole education. Uh, current UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson actually took a gap year working at Timbertop as a teaching assistant in 1983. Uh, Charles would return from Australia to Gordonston for his final year, was appointed head boy. He took his A-levels and earned a B in history, a C in French, and distinction in an optional history paper. He did gooder than many. In 1967, Charles attends college at Cambridge University to study archaeology, anthropology at Trinity College. He changes his major to history for the second part of his bachelor's degree. 1970, he finishes his degree with a 2-2 classification, which means, from what I understand, that he graduated with a lower division of second-class honors. So not, not the top of his class, but didn't barely scrape by either. The same year, Diana's parents divorce. Uh, she's just six years old. Her father wins primary custody of the children. Their marriage would officially dissolve two years later in 1969. Understandably, the, uh, the custody battle, uh, which was reported to be brutal, was traumatizing to Diana and her siblings. 
the Spencers would continue to live with their father at Park House. Uh, 1968, when she's seven, Diana attends a preparatory school, Riddlesworth Hall, about 30 miles from Sandringham. This was an elite boarding school for wealthy families to send their daughters to. On July 1st, 1969, Diana's eighth birthday, Charles is invested as Prince of Wales by the Queen, which basically means, you know, they put on a ceremony. Pomp and circumstance. Traditionally, the heir of the British throne is known as the Prince of Wales. Why? Tradition. So much of this stuff is just tradition. Uh, according to tradition, since 1301, the Prince of Wales has usually been the eldest living son, if and only if he is also the heir apparent of the King or Queen of England. King Edward I started this tradition basically as a, we respect you, please don't make trouble, just remain under our thumb, little nod to Wales. Because the Crown of England had annexed Wales recently in 1284. Before the invest investiture, uh, as a sign of respect, it seems, Charles spent a term at the University College at, of Wales at uh, Aberys Swith. Swith. <laughs> this is a tough one. Ab Aberys Swith. Swith. Uh, something like that. Learning to speak Welsh. Welsh words are really tricky, I think. Uh, March 8th, 1971, Charles flew himself to the Royal Air Force, Cranwell in Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire, I got that one, to train as a jet pilot. Sure, not shire. People, not hobbits. I'm learning. Uh, now an adult, Prince Charles had a lot of pressure on him, kind of. He had no real pressures. He didn't have to worry about where his next meal was coming from, or what he'd do if he got sick, since he, you know, didn't have health insurance. He didn't have to worry about his transmission finally going out and not having enough money for a new one. You know, mommy and daddy wanted him to get married. And, well, that was the end of his pressure. Uh, the one thing his parents always insisted on was that he find a bride. And to be fair to him, I mean, there was pressure to find a bride uh, in the sense that they had, he had to find one deemed appropriate by the crown, which was tricky. According to his biography, the prince couldn't just have anyone fill this role. Uh, his potential bride had to be highly born, have a virginal reputation, and could not be Catholic. It's fucking weird. Obviously, few women would meet all these criteria. <laughs> Gotta keep that image up! That's all they have left. What a strange game. British culture plays with their fake royalty. I will never totally understand it. I mean, if it makes them happy, good for them. I just can't take it seriously. Like, if I was given a chance to meet anyone on Earth, I don't think the Queen of England would be in the top thousand choices of mine. <laughs> to throw it back to last week, I would rather meet Corey Feldman than the Queen of England. And I don't even really want to meet Corey Feldman. <laughs> I do find the royals fascinating, though. I find how seriously they take these traditions that, to me, just ring so hollow now, since the royalty has no real power, just super fascinating. Like all these adults playing what looks to me like this big game of dress up and pretend. I don't know. I mean, there's a good chance I'd play it too. If I was born into it and, and continuing to play it, meant, it got, meant I got to live in a place like, you know, Sandringham Estate and not have to worry about getting a real job. Uh, back to Charles, like a lot of men in, the, in their early 20s, uh, he didn't want to get married. His great uncle and trusted advisor, Lord Louis Dickey Mountbatten, told him, I believe in a case like yours, that a man should sow his wild oats before settling down. Dickey was Prince Philip's maternal uncle, a member of the royal family and Charles's uh, unofficial mentor until he died at the age of 79, more in his death later. Pretty publicized, pretty uh, tragic death. In the summer of 1971, Charles meets Camilla Shand, and his life is forever changed. Allegedly, she introduced herself by saying, my great-grandmother was the mistress of your great-grandfather, so how about it? Ha! <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, she was referring to King Edward VII's affair with Alice Keppel, her direct ancestor. The two had a very well-documented affair. Uh, he was married to Alexander of Denmark. Alice would be Edward's mistress for the final dozen years of his life while she was also married. Based on the relationship that, you know, Charles and Camilla will have, I'm very open to believing that this intro actually happened. Both Charles and Camilla will, you know, carry on uh, with a, a long-lasting affair, as if that's just what royals do. Camilla was not born into nobility, but her family, her dad was a military man turned businessman and her mom was a homemaker. They did have some means. She was wealthy, educated in England, Switzerland, France, ran in the same social circles as Prince Charles and the Spencers. Maybe not part of like the inner inner circle, but, uh, you know, she showed up at a lot of the same parties. In September of 1971, Charles begins his naval career following his footsteps of his father, grandfather and great grandfathers. His six-week course at the Royal Naval College is followed by service on the guided missile destroyer HMS Norfolk and two frigates. The next year, 1972, Charles grows closer to Camilla. They spend time together, read, they fucked a bunch, and then Camilla's boyfriend, Andrew Parker Bowles, or when, excuse me, Camilla's boyfriend, Andrew Parker Bowles, was away from home because of his army service. Uh, the relationship was not just sexual, it seems. Uh, it seems like they really did fall in love, and in a different world, they would have gotten married. Unfortunately for them, though, Queen Mummy... And the other royals did not feel that Camilla was royal marriage material. Her family was wealthy, but not aristocrats. Old Dickie Mountbatten told Charles, I think it is disturbing for women to have experiences if they have to remain on a pedestal after marriage. So she didn't have the pure virginal reputation the royals wanted either. 
and how sad and fucked up. How interesting that Charles didn't tell his family to fuck off also and just follow his heart. Just couldn't walk away from that inheritance. Didn't want the family backlash, the tabloid frenzy would create if he abdicated his claim to the throne. Perhaps his parents had convinced him that a scandal like that would spell disaster for the royal image. Might not be wrong. And again, what a sad little, weird little game they play. Uh, when Charles won't propose to Camilla due to family pressure, she goes forward and gets engaged to her boyfriend on March 15th, 1972. Charles is sad and upset, but does not try to stop them uh, from getting married in July of 1973. 1974, Diana, now 13, goes to a new boarding school at West Heath School. All these boarding schools, I can't stop thinking about Harry Potter. At this point in her life, she's an accomplished pianist, enjoys dancing and domestic sciences, uh, earns an award for giving maximum help to the school and her classmates. She was a member of House Gryffindor with Harry, the Weasleys, and Hermione Granger. Or she would have been, if you know Hogwarts was, Hogwarts was real. Uh, Diana was also athletic. She enjoyed diving, tap dancing, ballet. Uh, she would practice dancing late at night in the ballet hall. She loved school. She enjoyed spending time there with her friends. She had no idea what she wanted to do with her life after school because she was only 13. At that age, she told her dad she was going to marry someone in the public eye, most likely an ambassador. Interesting. I imagine she thought that because she was not being groomed to be independent. She was groomed to be, you know, a noble bride. She wasn't the best student. Her least favorite part of school was academics. She failed her O-levels twice, the British school system, uh, so different than the American school system. This is basically the equivalent of, like, not finishing high school, like, like, uh, like not passing O-levels O levels is similar to like failing your GED. Diana will leave West Heath at the age of 16 for, for finishing school now. And a finishing school is a school for young women that focuses on teaching social graces and upper class cultural rights as preparation for entry into high society. A place for royals and women of high society to learn all the many, many do's and don'ts of proper etiquette. Pinky's out, motherfucker, pinky's out. That sort of thing, roughly. I really like and respect a certain level of manners and etiquette, but not, not this much. Not to this extent. While Diana was learning to be a proper lady of the royal court, Charles is qualifying as a helicopter pilot before joining 845 Naval Air, the 845 Naval Air Squadron. And very cool that he's serving and learning these skills, but was there any chance that he would actually be sent into battle uh, if something occurred in his life and be put at risk? I have to think no fucking way. I have to think that most of this is ceremonial. You know, done for optics. You know, was he, was he a real soldier or was this pageantry? Look, mommy, Charlie's flying the chop chop. I feel like it's that sort of thing. Uh, April 1975, Diana becomes Lady Diana Spencer when her, uh, her father inherits the title the 8th Earl of Spencer. Lady is a general title in England for any peeress below the rank of Duchess. And a peeress is a female member of the British nobility of that peerage system. Uh, the family now moves from Park House to the Spencer seat in Althorpe, a family home built in 1508 in Northamptonshire. And this is a fucking grand estate. Another, like something out of a movie about British royalty. This, and this shows like the Spencer family's wealth. This is a massive fucking home filled with enough expensive art to like become an art gallery sitting on a 14,000 acre estate in Northampton. The main house has 100,000 square feet of interior space and 31 bedrooms. Lady Di's brother, Charles Spencer, ninth Earl of Spencer, lives there now. But she's the people's princess. She's a commoner just like you. Just an untitled commoner slumming it on a property literally bigger than the fucking entirety of Manhattan. <laughs> I can't even comprehend that level of wealth. It costs over 130,000 pounds a year just to keep lights on this place now and the water running. This is part of the royal fantasy, right? This insane level of not just wealth, but old wealth and all that comes with that. Her family bought the land uh, for this estate in 1508, decades before the first European city founded in North America, St. Augustine, was even a thought in some conquistador's mind. Although Diana was now a lady, she was uh, still technically a commoner because while her father had a proper title, she did not. If she marries the wrong dude, goodbye, proper title. Oh, the scandal. On February 9th, 1976, Charles takes command of the coastal mine hunter, now HMS Bronington, for his last nine months in the Navy. Navy. 1977, 16-year-old Diana uh, attends finishing school in Switzerland. She's not great at it. Instead of focusing on learning French, making sure she knows exactly how to carry herself in a variety of situations, she mostly focuses on having a great time skiing. And her family doesn't care. Uh, they apparently consider her education just to be a uh, formality, right? Just so she can say she went there. Uh, her family fully, ex fully expected her to marry a rich man. And then she wouldn't have to work if she didn't want, want to. These people live in a world I've only experienced in like fictionalized versions of like, uh, of, you know, like books, TV, TV, uh, movies. <laughs> I've, I've never known someone who runs in these kind of circles. I doubt many who've grown up in America have, like unless their family's connected to European aristocracy. Arist or, yeah, oh my God, aristocracy. It just doesn't seem real. 
In November 1977, Diana and Charles, who've known each other to some extent since Diana was a small child, reconnect when he's invited to a weekend at Althorpe. Charles is there visiting her sister, Lady Sarah Spencer, six years older than Diana, seven years younger than Charles. Uh, Diana later recall, recalled Charles noticing her that weekend. She's 16. Uh, he's 29. She tells her school friends all about meeting the prince. According to Diana, her sister Sarah was all over Charles like a bad rash. Funny way of putting it. Charles first approached young Diana after a dinner and uh, asked uh, her to show him their art gallery. And I made, she's just, sorry, I just got confused there for a second. I made a lot of noise and he liked that. And he came up to me after dinner and we had a big dance, she said. She was surprised by the attention. And then they didn't speak again for the next two years. Her sister Sarah's chance of becoming Charles's bride soon vanished later in 1977 when she spoke to the tabloids about the prince. She told them she didn't yet love Charles and she wasn't ready for marriage. Maybe she wasn't that interested. It's, uh, it's not like she needed Charles's money. She could keep uh, living in one of the 31 bedrooms of their family summer home. Charles didn't care. If Sarah didn't want to marry him, plenty of other women would. He was considered one of the you know, most eligible bachelors in the world. And he's rumored to have a 15-inch bilingual penis that can juggle, ride a bike, and always select the perfect wine to pair with your meal. He's not rumored to have that. But still, he's a pretty big deal as a bachelor. And he was not in a real big hurry to get married despite the family pressure. Unlike his future bride, Charles did not have to be a virgin on his wedding day. And he spent, uh, well, he spent a lot of time with the ladies. Classic old double standard. In full effect here with the royals. Lucifina not happy. Uh, the 60s free love counterculture revolution a lot of British bands had been at the forefront of did not seem to bleed over into the sex lives of women either in the royal family or women considered to be married into the royal family. He briefly considered Lady Jane Wellesley's marriage material. He's a daughter of the Duke of Wellington, perfect virginal bridal candidate, but they had no romantic feelings for one another and just remained friends. Lady Jane, now 71, never got married. Scandal! What kind of royal lady would choose not to be married off to some other royal she didn't love? In the spring of 1978, Diana left finishing school uh, after the Easter term. She was now a free, independent, and single young woman. On November 14th, 1978, Charles turns 30. Now the pressure increases for him to find a bride. He had told news outlets back in 1975, I personally feel that a good age for a man to get married is around 30. Now he's like, ah, fuck. Why did I say that? Now he feels like he has to make good on that promise. That does sound like a pretty good, you know, age to get married, by the way. I got married for the first time at 23, and my ex-wife, not a bad person at all. Uh, so glad we had two awesome kids together. Uh, but if we would have both waited until we were 30, we would have never gotten married. Because we, you know, both would have known who we truly were, and that we weren't really compatible. That being said, you know, I know plenty of people do get married uh, younger, and their love stands the test of time. Kudos to you if you're one of them, but statistically, eh, better to wait. Diana was invited to a dance at Buckingham Palace for Charles' 30th birthday celebration. Unknown if the two interacted there. Uh, no sparks seemed to fly at that time if they did meet. But then the following year, old Dickie uh, Mountbatten finds a girl he wants Charles to marry, Amanda Natchbull, his granddaughter, Charles' second cousin. Non-virgins are out, but second cousins are in when it comes to marriage material. Uh, Charles proposes to her in 1979, but I guess luckily, kind of unluckily uh, for Diana, she rejects him. She didn't want to be part of the royal family. She didn't want to be under constant tabloid scrutiny. Scrutiny, don't blame her. His next girlfriend, Devine Sheffield, was accepted by the royal family, but then automatically eliminated as a candidate because her ex-boyfriend announced that they lived together in the past. Yuck. Penises in vaginas. What's going on? Poop hole loopholing, perhaps. Queen Elizabeth will not sign off on it. And good call. What kind of schlub shruddery was going on in that fuck pad those two harlots cohabitated in? Again, the free love vibe just never took uh, off, you know? Inside the royal family. Never shook the, the Queen Elizabeth's uh, panties quite often. Very little Lucifina in Queen Elizabeth, it seems. Funny how many uh, Illuminati rumors revolving around sexually abusing people float around her of all people. She seems about as sexual as a lamppost. I picture her having to shake some dust or sand out of her panties from time to time because she's just so fucking dry in there. Maybe that's partially why there are so many wild and sexual conspiracy rumors uh, that float around Queen Elizabeth and the royal family. Perhaps because they seem so asexual publicly, people assume they must be hiding some depraved form of sexuality. Charles now dates Anna Wallace, a Scottish heiress. But then she ends uh, things because she feels that Charles is still too fixated on Camilla, which he is. Camilla and Charles secretly resume their relationship in 1979. Her first marriage is now over. They wanted to be together, but now the crown is more opposed than ever to their union. Charles is forbidden from marrying a divorcee. Mommy won't allow it. And Charles sometimes seems like mommy's little boy bitch. All right, grow a backbone, Charlie Puddin' Pie. Follow your heart. Tell mommy dearest and other royal relatives to get fucked. Sure, they'll, they'll take away some of your inheritance, but uh, there's no way they were going to let him live in squalor, be homeless or something. 
that publicity would bring them too much shame. Uh, much of what made it so difficult for Charles to find a wife at this time was the paparazzi. A lot of women just did not want those parasites all over everything they did. One of Charles' ex-girlfriends made a public statement that reporters and photographers broke into her house, left notes, followed her everywhere. Sounds terrible. And the women who didn't mind that level of intrusion, Charles, well, he was skeptical of them. He questioned their motivations. Why would they be okay with that? Were they fame hungry? Did they actually like him? Charles constantly worried about girls dating him for all the wrong reasons. In 1976, he said, you see, every time a girl tells me that she loves me, I have to ask myself whether she really loves me or just wants to be queen. And whoever I choose is going to have a jolly hard job, always in my shadow, having to walk a few steps behind me, all that sort of thing. Uh, pretty revealing here that he expects his wife to live in his shadow, walk behind him. That would not happen with Diana. Uh, he would live in her shadow, and he did not like it. In uh, 1979, Diana moves into an apartment in London. She moves to the city not long after finishing, finishing school. For a while, she actually works as a nanny for an American businesswoman, Mary Robertson, who did not know that she was uh, nobility. Uh, she took care of Mary's toddler son, Patrick, handled several other activities, including doing their laundry, picking up a bunch of toys, washing the dishes, uh, and she did this for a whole year. Diana and Mary, Patrick would keep in touch for the rest of Diana's life. That's, that is very cool. Uh, this backstory would help endear Diana to the British public. And I, and I got to say, uh, endears her to me as well. She didn't have to ever take a job like that. She just wanted to. And she was a great nanny, apparently. Patrick loved her. Uh, also worked a bit as an assistant at Young England Kindergarten. When she first moved to London, she lived in her a mother's apartment. Then she moved into an apartment her parents bought her as a coming-of-age gift. Cost around 100,000 pounds. She lived there with three of her best friends. Diana's family financially supported her. She got an undisclosed but presumably significant inheritance at age 18, but didn't just party it up. She worked even though she didn't need the money because she loved being around children. And while she was working, she also made sure not to date. She did still very much have her eye on a future uh, aristocratic wedding. She knew she had to keep up a good reputation, a virginal reputation, so she could marry a man of high status if that chance arose. And in 1980, Diana reconnects again with the royal family and starts a friendship with Charles. And then a little bit of dick brings them together as more than friends. Not that kind of dick. Dicky Mountbatten. In July of 1980, Diana ends up consoling the distraught Prince Charles at a house party. He is upset because Dicky Mountbatten has just been blown the fuck up by an IRA bomb. God, remember that sucked? The Irish Republican Army bombed all sorts of people for years, including old Dicky. The 79-year-old was going out lobster potting and tuna fishing in a 30-foot boat with some family, which had been moored in the harbor at Mullagmore. IRA member Thomas McMahon uh, had snuck into the boat the night before, planted a 50-pound radio-controlled bomb, and once Mountbatten was a few hundred feet from shore, he detonated it, and it damn near blew Dickie's legs clean off. When rescuers boated over to the crash site, he was somehow still alive, had his life jacket on, but he was barely alive. He died before making it to shore. One of his grandsons, only 14, would also die, as would his eldest daughter's mother-in-law and a 15-year-old crew member. Other family members would be injured tragic and not surprisingly highly publicized and when charles is at this party and upset following this death diana approaches him and tells him you look so sad when you walked up to the aisle at lord mountbatten's funeral it was the most tragic thing i've ever seen my heart bled for you when i watched i thought it's wrong you're lonely you should be with somebody to look after you and after diana said this she said that charles quote leapt on her she thought well this isn't very cool i thought men were not supposed to be this obvious she now knew that charles was attracted to her she knew that, uh, at the very least, little Charles was very interested. The pocket prince. Uh, but she couldn't tell if Charles had actual feelings for her, in part because she never had a boyfriend. She was really naive when she started dating Charles. Super virginal. Had not seriously dated, or really even casually dated anyone. After the party, Charles made more efforts to see Diana. He may not have uh, ever really loved her early on, but, uh, but little Charles, the pocket prince, was really into her. On September 7th, 1980, Daily Star journalists spot Charles kissing an unknown girl by the River D at uh, Balmoral Castle. But not a girl. It's uh, They find out, and this is uh, becomes a huge scandal, uh, who he is kissing. This is pretty fucking gross. The legless corpse of elderly Dickie Mountbatten with a wig and red lipstick. It's a tremendous scandal. Queen Elizabeth had strictly forbidden Charles to stay away from Dickie's corpse. And Diana's devastated. She doesn't feel betrayed exactly. just confused and nauseous. What's wrong with me? Why did I even say that? That's horrific and unnecessary. Probably not funny. Charles is photographed, of course, with Diana. And Diana, well, she has Dickie's legless corpse on her lap. She's pushed her right hand into his ribcage. Is working him like a zombie puppet. The scandal's tremendous. Front page of tabloids across the UK. Headlines like future princess or necromancer puppet master. I doubled down on a bad joke. I should be institutionalized for suggesting that nonsense. Charles is only photographed with Diana. 
and it's not scandalous. Uh, September 1980, Diana visits the royal family at Balmoral Castle, the royal family's Scottish estate. Uh, <laughs> I should talk a little bit about this castle I've mentioned several times. Queen Elizabeth actually privately owns this little dump, right? Like if uh, she gets everything taken away, she loses her title, she still has this castle. And this castle sits on roughly 50,000 acres, almost five times the size of Manhattan. No big deal. Roughly 150 different buildings on this estate. It's like its own fucking country. The castle has 52 bedrooms. 52! Can't find a reliable source for square footage, but a 2020 U.S. real estate article uh, placed the value of the castle at roughly $140 million. And that seems very low to me, actually. So anyway, this hole-in-the-wall, shithole summer home, Charlie teaches Diana how to fish. And they're uh, photographed by the press. Now people are wondering if she might truly become his future bride. She's 19. Because she has close ties to the royal family, Charles assumes she'll understand the pressures, excuse me, of her future role. Uh, Even Camilla approves because she thinks Diana is young and naive and won't interfere in her continuing affair with Charles. Uh, Interesting way to look at it. Diana's father and uncle soon publicly vouch for her virginity. Weird. To enhance her chances of royal marriage. Uh, Comes across pretty creepy, and it is. But they did do this because the media was obsessed with speculating about the virginity of anyone Charles would date. So super fucking weird. But it wasn't like it came out of nowhere. You know, it wasn't like some... uh, (laughs) <laughs> British journalist Earl Spencer is it true that your daughter Diana may become the future queen of England and then he just you know blurt out no one's touched a pussy no one not even Diana I've kept a close eye on my daughter's hoo-ha her entire life sometimes I would check on her when she was sleeping just to make sure her hymen was unmolested I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry what were you saying it wasn't quite like that it's so creepy that there's that kind of interest in her sex life or lack thereof uh, after the river photos the press started following Diana around her apartment around the streets of London she was soon feeling overwhelmed the royal family strangely refuses to give her any security Maybe they're testing her. Maybe based on last week's celebrity cloning suck, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip were just busy. They were out of the office, too busy torturing kids in an Illuminati cloning facility to be bothered with providing her security detail. Uh, England was fascinated by this new couple. Diana seemed shy and sweet. She quickly earned the nickname Shy Di. People seemed to love how humble she seemed. Uh, She would very quickly become more popular than Charles. Charles was intelligent and well-educated, but aloof and a bit awkward. Diana was naturally likable in a way he just wasn't. Before he died, Mountbatten had advised Charles that he should choose a suitable and sweet-charactered girl, and he felt that Diana was this girl. He also believed Diana's young age would allow him to mold her into the kind of wife he wanted. He he was not apparently in love with her by any means. Charles believed marriage was the last decision on which I should... What do you say? The last decision on which I want my head to be ruled by my heart. Kind of a sad way to look at it. Uh, His grandparents didn't love each other at first, but grew to love one another after they got married. He hoped the same would happen with Diana. And if it didn't, oh well. Well, there's always Camilla. In January of 1981, Daddy Dearest Prince Philip orders Charles to either propose to Diana or let her go to spare her reputation. Charles then confessed to his friend, I'm terrified sometimes of making a promise and then perhaps living to regret it. It's just a matter of taking an unusual plunge into some rather unknown circumstances that inevitably disturbs me, but I expect it will be the right thing in the end. Oh, the call of duty. Before the engagement, Diana actually stayed with the Parker uh, Bowles family for a little bit. They were all part of the same social circle. She noticed how Camilla obsessed over Charles's personal life, told Diana what to do, uh, what not to do in front of the royal family. Way back at this point, Diana wondered if something's still going on between the two. Uh, the day before the engagement, Diana is sent to Clarence House, a royal property. And she arrives at this house, or after she arrives there, a candid policeman tells her, I just want you to know this is the last, this is your last night of freedom ever in the rest of your life. So make the most of it. Wow. Diana uh, worried about bad things uh, that could come with continual press coverage, but not enough to later say no to Charles. Interesting that she knew about Camilla. Keep thinking about that. She uh, knew what was going to happen to her personal life and still went through with it. She was so young. Had been so sheltered. Uh, February 6, 1981. Charles proposes to Diana with an 18-carat white gold ring topped with a 12-carat Salem sapphire surrounded by 14 diamonds. It was given to him by his mother, who no longer, you know, wore it as a (laughs) clip-clip. Come on! Gosh dang! Uh, You knew I couldn't stay away from that forever. No, it was made by the crown jewelers Gerard, inspired by a brooch created by, for Prince Albert to give to Queen Victoria as a wedding gift. If you want to buy a replica, it's going to set you back about two mil. Uh, But, for that price, you, you do get a free engraving and free shipping. Steal of a deal. If you have that kind of cash laying around. Diana accepted his proposal without hesitation. Charles later will claim to have felt instant regret. He and Diana had only seen each other a total of 13 times before the engagement. They still didn't really know each other. He worried they wouldn't be able to overcome some of their differences and have a successful successful marriage. But he still asked. It was what the royal family wanted. Good for the image. 
An odd detail about their early relationship, according to protocol, Diana was not allowed to call Charles by his name until their engagement. <laughs> She'd always called him sir. Man, imagine that. Hilarious for me to imagine my wife Lindsay calling me sir <laughs> before our engagement. Or now, if I can at any point. I would not have worked. Uh, hey, baby, do you want to uh, grab some sushi? Uh, baby, I think you mean sir, woman. <laughs> She'd have been like, bitch, you drive a Honda hatchback with a bumper partially held on with some fucking wire. Get out of here with that sir shit. Uh, Diana became sick with bulimia the week after the engagement. Charles was at least partially to blame here. He had put his hand on her waist and said, oh, a bit chubby here, aren't we? Yee. Need to look perfect, Diana. It's what mommy wants. That also would not have flown with my wife. She, she would have been like, have you seen your gut, dickhead? You go get some Gerard Butler to 300 apps before you say shit to me. Uh, stress and social pressures also led to her bulimia, tabloid pressure. Uh, February 24th, 1981, Charles and Diana announced their engagement. Interesting time to make this announcement. In the early 80s, British public opinion is turning against the monarchy. The government is assessing their financial value to the nation, and they're considering getting rid of the royals, right? which could still happen at any point. Uh, when Charles and Diana announced their engagement, the government sees a big money-making opportunity. Right, The fairy tale optics will be good for tourism, she may have really kind of like saved the monarchy. When an interviewer asked if they were both in love, uh, they said, of course. But then Charles added whatever in love means. Hmm, so many red flags, but it's ending well before they get married. Uh, on March 9th, 1981, Diana attends her first royal engagement at Goldsmiths Hall. She wears a black strapless dress. She thought it would be fine because all the girls her age wore dresses like that, but the press found it scandalous. Should have paid more attention at finishing school, less skiing, more dress protocol focus. Uh, she, you know, she makes headlines for breaking royal protocol. On March 29th, 1981, an iconic image of Diana sobbing while Charles boards a plane makes the front pages of the newspapers. At the time, the public believed she was so sad to see her fiance leave. Diana would later reveal the real story behind this picture. The day before, Camilla had called Charles and Diana had left the room felt feeling heartbroken. She thought their affair was over. In mid-July, 1981, Diana finds a bracelet that Charles planned to give to Camilla. Someone from Charles's office had told her about it. The bracelet had GF engraved on it. This was an inside joke between Charles and Camilla, referring to her as his girl Friday. Diana was understandably, you know, pretty pissed off, but not pissed off enough to break off the engagement. Charles refused to talk to her about it. Diana later said that at this point, he'd found the virgin, the sacrificial lamb, and in a way he was obsessed with me. But it was hot and cold, hot and cold. You never knew what mood it was going to be. She told her sister she couldn't go through with the marriage, but they said it was too late to chicken out. And young Diana foolishly listened to them. Young meat sacks listening, much better to break off an engagement than it is to break off a wedding, right? There'll be a lot less collateral damage. Easier for everyone to pick up the pieces. Even if it's like, you know, day before the wedding shit. No one should get married because they feel pressured. They should want to. Uh, the press praised Diana for losing weight prepping for her wedding. They had no idea while she was extremely sick with bulimia, or that she was extremely sick with bulimia. When she uh, got measured for her wedding dress, initially her waist was 29 inches. On her wedding day, it was 23.5. Oh my God. She had, according to Diana herself, shrunk into nothing. July 28th, 1981, the day before the big wedding, Charles cries. He is not excited to be getting married. He is in love with Camilla. Uh, Diana, also a wreck, has a further relapse with her eating disorder. She eats everything she can find, then throws up, you know, uh, the rest of the night. On July 29th, 1981, despite neither the bride nor the groom really watching it, the royal wedding of the century takes place. 2,650 guests attend, many of them royals or celebrities, and an estimated 1 billion people watch around the world. All right, up to a billion. Diana woke up uh, the morning of her wedding at 5 a.m. She later said she felt like a lamb being taken to slaughter. How crazy, this much unhappiness behind uh, the scenes of the most publicized wedding of our lifetimes. Diana wore a taffeta wedding dress made with silk, lace, 10,000 pearls designed by David and Elizabeth Emanuel. She wore a 1700 Spencer family tiara, a 25-foot veil. Her dress so big it almost didn't fit inside the carriage. Diana was nervous. She mixed up Charles' names when she said her vows. She called him Prince Charles instead of Charles Philip. Or I'm sorry, called him Philip Charles instead of Charles Philip. Otherwise, the day went, you know, perfectly for a marriage of two people who did not love each other or want to get married. After the royal wedding, Diana now takes on the title Princess of Wales. And the people of Wales rejoice. They now had one of their own standing next to the future king. Now they didn't care. She wasn't Welsh. English and Scottish mainly, just some more title stuff. Because of that title, I actually thought she was from Wales until doing the research for this side. Diana later said she had some hope for her marriage the day after her marriage, but by two or by day two, it was completely gone. And she had good reason to say that. While on their honeymoon cruise, <laughs> Charles pulls out his diary and two pictures of Camilla fall out. My God, hopefully they weren't nudes. Dude, come on, your honeymoon? It's fucking, what are you doing? Not putting a lot of effort into not ruining this trip. 
Then she sees cufflinks with a Chanel logo, two connected C's, and uh, finds out that it's, it's a gift from Camilla. They have a huge argument. For their honeymoon, they went to the Mountbatten family home at Broadlands. Then they traveled to Gibraltar. They joined the Royal Yacht for a 12-day cruise. This, this Royal Yacht's fucking gigantic. It's over 400 feet long, can sleep 250 passengers, plus 270 crew and officers. So uh, a little bit more than a kayak, you know? Uh, they ended with a stay at a tiny, you know, little rinky-dink Balmoral Castle. Charles and Diana then make their permanent residence at Highgrove House near Tetbury, Gloucestershire. Now, this dump really is tiny. This little fucking shed shack of a house uh, only sits on 353 acres. You can see neighbors in the distance without binoculars, you know, cl- really cramped and claustrophobic. It's not even quite 30,000 square feet. I don't even know how they fit in there. Only has nine bedrooms, barely six bathrooms. They might as well have moved into a doghouse next to a dumpster. Uh, they also had an apartment at Kensington Palace. None of their homes had floors made out of blood diamonds or sex slaves for living furniture, so they were really slumming it. Uh, Diana's still just 19, thinks she's prepared for marriage, uh, thinks she'll have the support of her husband. She wants to put effort to making her marriage work. The possibility of being a queen is far away. She's mostly concerned at the present time with media coverage. Uh, from Charles's perspective, leading up to the wedding, Diana felt uh, paranoid that the palace was trying to control her, that Charles was still seeing his former you know, girlfriend, Camilla. He will later claim that they were not dating at this time. That seems like bullshit. He said she was unhappy at their wedding rehearsals. Rehearsals? Well, yeah, probably because he was still fucking Camilla. From his perspective, the honeymoon was awful, not because of his obsession with Camilla, but because of Diana's poor behavior. He said she'd cry in her bedroom, skip dinner with the family, which is a breach of protocol. She would, she suffered from insomnia. She rapidly lost weight, showed signs of an eating disorder, self-harm tendencies. She had rapidly shifting emotions that overwhelmed Charles. He didn't understand how to deal with her. He'd ask her, you know, what is it now, Diana? What have I said now to make you cry? He promised her his affair was over, but, you know, nothing would make Diana happy. He left her bedroom in his family's castle to stay in the Balmoral countryside, which only made Diana more upset. Charles' mentors mentors recommended he get a therapist for Diana, that she take Valium. She refused. Charles felt this only fueled her paranoia that royals wanted to sedate her. He did summon a therapist, Dr. Alan McGlashan, but Diana refused to see him. So Charles instead asked Dr. McGlashan for help and was his, was his client for 14 years. Uh, according to Charles, Diana was extremely jealous, liked to pick fights. His cousin, Pamela Hicks, reported Diana would resurrect a row with him even when he was saying his prayers. She would hit him over the head while he knelt. <laughs> so that's very, very unhappy from the very beginning. In his uh, pro-Diana book, Andrew Morton agreed about her severe mental illness. She attempted suicide, suffered from bulimia, self-harm, depression, severe anxiety. Both parties had emotional inadequacies from their upbringings. Diana felt empty and detached, feared abandonment, had difficulty with lasting relationships. With fr- uh, when friends had previously grown tired of her temper and moods, they'd left her. And she did some pretty dramatic things early on in her relationship with Charles. Once in a rage, she literally threw herself down the stairs. And while she was pregnant, also cut herself with razors and glass in front of Charles. And Diana did later admit to all this. According to Prince Charles biographer Sally Bettle, Diana also disliked Charles personally. And not because of his affairs with Camilla, just not a good match. They should have just never been married. She hated his hobbies, you know, polo, painting, gardening, his love of Shakespeare. She allegedly even taunted him, telling him he would never, never be king. Uh, she tried to put a wedge between him and his friends before the marriage. Allegedly, she even uh, made him get rid of his beloved dog, Harvey. Frequently kicked him out of her bedroom. Um, this Dally, this officer, or I'm sorry, Sally, cl- or claims that uh, Charles even slept on a single bed with only a teddy bear to keep him company for a while. That, that seems a little bit fabricated to me here, but who knows? <laughs> How unbelievably fucking sad if, if this dude in his early 30s really was laying on a single bed in some royal estate you know, all, all upset, holding on to a teddy bear. Just, first, mommy and daddy shook me away to boarding school. Now Diana Dudu won't let me sleep in my own bed. You'll never treat me so cruel, will you, Mr. Paddington? You'll always love me and tell me I'm a good boy, won't you? Uh, from October 27th to October 30th, 1981, the couple takes their first tour together, a three-day visit to Wales. Charles, not expecting his shy wife to be so popular. And then, wherever they go, crowds start to chant, We want Diana! We want Diana! And that probably didn't feel great. We don't want you. We don't care about you. Please get your wife out here. You are boring. Uh, Prince William is conceived in October. This is a godsend for Diana, she says, because it occupies her mind, gives her something to look forward to. Uh, November 1981, the royals announced the pregnancy. Diana suffers from severe morning sickness and has to cancel many of her engagements. She feels embarrassed, like she's letting everybody down. January of 1982, news comes out that Diana fell down the stairs while pregnant, according to Diana. This was a suicide attempt. But at the time, you know, she and the royals uh, just thought it was an accident. Uh, what, man, what a strange suicide attempt, too. Uh, throwing oneself down the stairs. That seems like a bad way to take yourself out. 
Seems like a great way to just really permanently hurt yourself, but keep living. Clearly, she was not well. Uh, baby William, luckily unharmed. Diana only has minor injuries. What led to the stair incident? Diana said she was crying. Charles refused to listen to her, so she threw herself down the stairs. Charles thought she was exaggerated about all her problems, and she felt no one understood her. Holy royal drama, bad man. I got to say, these two both seem like children who happen to be of adult age in many of these moments. Uh, June 21st, 1982, Prince William Arthur Philip Lewis is born. Diana only 20 at the time. Uh, Charles wanted the children's first names to be Arthur and Albert, but Diana apparently shut that idea down. To the outside world, she appears to be thriving. She's beautiful, graceful, seamlessly adopts her role of Princess of Wales. Uh, she's given, you know, the heir to the throne, a son. She's wearing the latest fashions, working for admirable charities, a literal princess. Her life is a commoner's dream, but she's fucking miserable. She and Charles' marriage not going well. She suffers from severe postpartum depression on top of low self-esteem, bulimia, constant bombardment from the papar paparazzi. She later admits her postpartum depression affects her marriage. She begins self-harming. Her bulimia worsens. She'd binge eat when she had a busy day out in public, then throw up that evening. She says the royal family used her eating disorder to label her as unstable instead of trying to understand the disorder. Instead of expressing concern, they would just accuse her of, quote, wasting food. <laughs> and if they really did that, that's fucking cold-blooded. Is Diana, is Diana okay? I heard her throwing up in the bathroom. She's fine. She's just in there wasting food again. Never have I known anyone who loved to waste food like Lady Love Handles. In March 1983, Diana, Charles, and William take a tour of Australia and New Zealand. Adoring crowds wait for Diana. Charles' jealousy grows. Uh, on September 15th, 1984, Prince Henry Charles Albert David is born. Today we call him Prince Harry. Diana claimed she knew the entire time she was pregnant, she was having a boy, but did not tell Charles he wanted a girl. And when Harry was born, he was disappointed. When Diana saw his reaction, she said something inside me closed off. Our marriage, the whole thing went down the drain. Seems like it had already gone down the drain. Uh, 1985, Diana starts an affair with her bodyguard, Barry Manneke. Maybe. Some sources say she may have had an affair. Many others say she just let the tip in. Uh, no, the others seem certain she did. The full extent of their affair is still debated. Uh, Diana did admit to falling in love with him. The two had emotional Im intimacy. Uh, she later described him as the greatest love of my life. And I'm going to say this is a balls deep kind of love. Some, emo some emotional love and some hope you're having fun with Camilla Charles. Barry's currently knocking my back out. Loophole in my poop hole kind of love. After Diana spoke of the love she had for Barry, uh, he was immediately transferred away from her security detail. And he died two years later at the age of 39 in a traffic accident. Conspiracies began to swirl about the royal family having him killed. An inquest finds this to be false, but then, of course, you know, rumors swirl of cover-up, and then, you know, when Diana later dies, this will be combined uh, with his death earlier, and then, you know, the royal family's killing everybody in car crashes. I wonder if they wanted him dead, why wait until two years after his affair is exposed? Uh, 1986, if he wasn't fucking around already with, uh, which I think he was, Charles is now for sure fucking around with Camilla again. And this stresses Diana out. Weird that an affair that just won't go away uh, will do that. Uh, on May 6, 1986, Diana faints at the Expo Exposition or Expo, ex, Expo Exhibition, on her Canadian tour with Charles. She's tired, hadn't eaten in several days. Charles berates her for fainting in public, asks her why she couldn't have fainted behind a closed door. Why do you have to faint in front of everyone? Uh, Diana asks if she could stay behind and rest. Charles insists uh, that she needs to get back out there and attend their engagements. Right, They're fighting all the time now. A few months later, November 1986, Diana starts an affair with Captain James Hewitt, a cavalry officer, who was her former riding instructor. Uh-huh, mm-hmm, not surprised. One day, teaching her how to ride a horse. The next day, she's the horse. That's how they get you. Classic riding instructor, sexual power move. I've come across this a thousand times. In so many stories. They're like, oh, you just want to hop on here and swing your leg over. and just so, no, Not quite like that. You just want to swing your leg over and then with your knees, gently but firmly, press on the sides a bit. Ah, not quite like here. Uh, just, just let me show you. Pretend to be the mayor. Just get down on all fours. Yes, just like that. Then I hop on your back here. and I press my legs in gently around your hips. And then maybe we're riding, and we're riding, and I'm just kind of rubbing back and forth. And we're like, this, I think this would work better if we were both naked, and then we just ride. And the next thing you know, you're getting barebacked. And that's how, if you're not careful, you can show up at a lesson, hoping to learn how to improve your riding skills, and you can leave pregnant. I, I, I fucking, I've seen it a thousand times. Uh, in all seriousness, their affair lasted until 1991. Uh, in October 1987, newspapers began publishing articles speculating that Charles and Diana have spent over 30 days apart and are not happily married at all. February. 1989, Diana finally directly confronts Camilla. It happens at a house party. She tells her, I obviously am in the way. It must be hell for both of you. But I do know what is going on. Don't treat me like an idiot. This also makes it to the tabloids. Apparently anyone who has any dirt on them now 
They're just immediately selling it to tabloids. According to Diana, after this confrontation, people on her husband's side try to convince Charles to put her in a home, as in have her committed, but quietly, discreetly, come up with a cover story. Uh, Diana, one time public image asset has become a liability, an embarrassment to the royal family for not keeping quiet on her husband's affair, for having affairs of her own. Shit's getting messy now. Queen Mummy, not pleased. As the 90s began the following year, rumors of Queen Victoria syndrome began to run rampant. QBS, little used term, for when the British population tires of an aging monarch and a parasitic royal family that seems out of touch with reality. Things not going well for the royals right now. A poll taken in 1990 finds that roughly half the population supports the idea of abdication. No more royals. The public breakdown of Charles and Diana's marriage is well known and all the scandals and gossip around it and the insight it gives into how the royal family conducts their business has many British, and British citizens thinking something along the lines of, oh, fuck off. Enough's enough. Enough's enough. In the spring of 1991, Diana sits down at Kensington Palace now for a series of secret interviews. They're recorded by Diana's friend, Dr. James Colthurst, and will be the basis of English journalist Andrew Morton's explosive biography on Diana, released the next year, as well as a 2017 documentary about the interview tapes. More on that in just a second. 1992, not a good year for Her Majesty. The drama queen, actual queen, Elizabeth, calls 1992 her horrible year because of some of the following events. February 11th, Diana is photographed alone in front of Taj Mahal. The building was constructed as a symbol of love from a man to his wife, and the image of Diana alone is framed by the media as symbolic of her broken marriage. This pic gets a lot of play. Shows up on a lot of tabloids, becomes a pretty iconic photo. Uh, June 7th, Andrew Morton's book, Diana, Her True Story, gets serialized in the papers before its publication. It's a huge fucking hit. The talk of the nation. Describes in great detail Diana's struggles with bulimia, depression, suicide, the affairs. At first, Diana tries to deny being involved in the book, but then Morton reveals she helped him write it and she confesses. Queen Mummy is very angry. June 16th, Diana, her true story is published in its entirety, causing further outrage amongst the royals and scandal. It'll be made into a popular TV movie the very next year. It's a story that will not go away for the royal family. Morton, interestingly, will uh, publish a scathing, unauthorized biography of Tom Cruise in 2008 that will attack Scientology so aggressively it wasn't even published in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand due to libel laws in those countries. I love it! Hail Nimrod and let those motherfuckers have it, Morton! August 24th, Squiddy, Squidgy Gate shocks the nation. The press detailed recorded phone conversations between Diana and her friend James Gilby. And the British Secret Service, aka some spies, released these conversations to the public. The conversations were from December 31st, 1991. Diana complained about the royal family called Life with Charles Real Torture. The scandal was called Squidgy Gate because Gilby nicknamed Diana Squidgy. Diana thought Squidgy Gate was meant to tarnish her, her reputation, some royal sabotage, but that did not work. The public felt sorry for her. Uh, she worried about the royal family attacking her image because uh, now she and Char Charles are engaged in pre-divorce discussions. It's not a matter of if her marriage is going to end. It's a when and how. November 13th, Camilla Gate now makes the front pages of the tabloids. The press had leaked a private conversation between Prince Charles and his mistress, Camilla Pachabals. Uh, yes, uh, the conversations were from December of 1989. Charles, uh, in his, uh, tapes told Camilla some pretty weird shit. Like, uh, I'll just live inside your trousers or something, perhaps as a Tampax. <laughs> Look at these two. Jade wants to crawl in her vagina, just soak up her period. That, that's love or lust or kink. I don't, I don't know, probably kink. Uh, Camilla must've been an absolute fucking beast in the sack. Charles was clearly extremely sexually uh, attracted to her. They had some serious chemistry. What a shame they just didn't get married, you know, right after they met when they were young and avoid all this. All this could have been avoided if either the royal family would have condoned Charles's original interest in wanting to marry her or if he would have been strong enough to break away from mummy and daddy and just marry her without their approval. Uh, December 9th, 1992, Buckingham Palace announces, with regret, the prince and princess of Wales have decided to separate. Three out of four Britons now believe the royal family is fucked. They're completely falling apart. Their popularity is rock bottom. Diana now lives at her office in Kensington Palace. Charles lives at St. James Palace in Highgrove. Diana tells the children a week before Charles makes a uh, official announcement. After the separation, they actually start to get along better. Diana seems happier, right? They're friendlier towards one another. Charles drops in often to visit her and the kids. Uh, the one thing that unites them is their love for the boys. Although things, although things settle down between her and Charles, Diana said people's agendas changed overnight. Really speaking of like the royal family uh, and the tabloids. I was now a separated wife of the Prince of Wales. I was a problem. I was a liability. And how are we going to deal with her? Allegedly, palace officials now blocked her from visiting abroad, prevented her from working in her charities, even stole some of her mail. 
It's now in the royal family's best image to, uh, you know, to, uh, best, best image interest to make her look worse than Charles. On December 3rd, 1993, Dinah announces she will be reducing her time in public to have a more private life. She's exhausted. Uh, she thinks Charles's employees, who also work for her, it's messy now, are trying to undermine her, uh, undermine her work on charities, you know, get more publicity, uh, you know, for Charles's charities and hers. June 29th, 1994, more scandal. Prince Charles admits to being unfaithful in a, in a TV interview. He doesn't say the woman's Camilla, but everyone knows who he's talking about. Later that year, an authorized biography of Charles officially confirms his affair with Camilla. At some point in 1995, Diana meets a heart surgeon named uh, Hosnet Khan and begins an affair with him. Oh, meets old Hot Nuts. Hot Nuts Khan. On December 20th, 1995, a secret interview Diana does with uh, the BBC is broadcast for the entire world to see. The royal family is caught off guard and furious. It's a PR battle now. They had no knowledge of this interview before it came out. In her interview with Martin uh, Bashir, Diana tells, Diana tells him she knew about the affair between Charles and Camilla. There were three of us in this marriage, she said, so it was a bit crowded. She's also open about her own affair with James Hewitt. Yes, I adored him. Yes, I was in love with him, but I was very let down, she says. She also hints in the interview that Charles is unfit to take the throne. She's honest about her mental illness, described her bulimia as a secret disease you inflicted upon yourself because your self-esteem is at low ebb and you don't think you're worthy or valuable. It's a repetitive pattern which is very destructive to yourself. The queen is so fucking mad. A common phrase she uttered in response to private family business was, never complain, never explain. That was her credo on that kind of stuff and uh, Diana obviously broke that rule with her BBC interview. Diana agreed to take uh, half the responsibility for her failed marriage but no more than that in this interview. Uh, her aides later said she regretted doing the interview. She only did it because she wanted to take some control of the media narrative surrounding her separation and not let the royal family dictate that narrative. And that would suck to have your divorce, divorce play out in such an extremely public way. To know that if anyone recognizes you, they know a bunch of dirty laundry about you that you'd rather keep private. Uh, July 15th, 1996, Charles and Diana officially filed for divorce after months of intense negotiations about child custody and I love this, royal titles. Mommy, don't let her be the Princess of Wales. I don't want her to have that title. I want to give that to Camilla, Mommy. Uh, August 28th, 1996, the divorce is finalized. Diana will remain the Princess of Wales. She keeps that title. Uh, also keeps her apartments at Kensington Palace. Uh, she does agree to give up her title of Her Royal Highness and future claims to the throne. She resigned most of her charities and patronages, but uh, remained a patron of her few favorite uh, charities like Leprosy Mission, National AIDS Trust, Hospital for Sick Children, also continues her humanitarian efforts, particularly to raise awareness for uh, about landmines in Angola. Now free from royal constraints, she can do what she wants. Uh, she wants William and Henry to have an understanding of people's emotions, their insecurities, people's distress, and their hopes and dreams. So she takes them to hospitals, homeless shelters, orphanages, takes them to fast food restaurants, public transportation to show them what life is like for regular people. January 15th, 1997, Diana, Diana completes her famous walk across that partially cleared landmine field to symbolize the importance of banning landmines. Very iconic image again. One of the most well-known photos of her. Uh, in the summer of 1997, Diana goes on vacation with a new boyfriend, Dodi Fayad. Dodi Al Fayad. Uh, he's a film producer from Egypt, also the son of a billionaire, Muhammad Al Fayad, former owner of London's Harrods department store, uh, at one time easily the most famous store in the world, and the Fulham FC soccer team. Dodi, most famous for producing *Chariots of Fire*, he invited Diana and her children on his yacht in the south of France, where the paparazzi took plenty of pictures of him. The two had first met in 1986 at a polo match where he and Charles played an opposing team, some serious rich people shit. Uh, they reconnected date after the divorce. They then spent time in Sardinia, the south of France, in Paris, and the tabloids could not get enough. Rumors spread that the royal family and Prime Minister Tony Blair disapproved of Doty. Why is the Prime Minister weighing in on this? I have no idea. I guess just because of British obsession with the royal family. Uh, in late August 1997, Diana is back on Doty's yacht, the paparazzi photo uh, photographing them kissing. I bet that dude had a sweet fucking yacht. I couldn't find out the specs on it. Can you imagine how having a, a billionaire dad, being a film producer, and having a big-ass yacht, how much that would help your dating life if you're single? Right? A lot of big yachts have helipads. I bet his had a helipad. Holy shit. Are you free next weekend? We should spend a weekend on my yacht. I'll send a private car to take you to a private airport. They'll fly you to Greece. Then my helicopter can take you straight out to my yacht. How do you like your caviar? Lifestyles of the rich and famous type shit. Reminds me of watching that show as a kid. August 30th, 1997, Diana and Dodie return to Paris. Rumors spread they might get married soon. Allegedly, Dodie even purchased an engagement ring that morning. Uh, it's not a confirmed uh, you know, rumor, but possibly. Uh, these rumors will quickly fade, though, when it becomes abundantly clear the very next day Diana will never get married again. Late on August 30th, 1997, Saturday night, 
a car with Diana, Doty, uh, you know, Doty Fayad, uh, a body, bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, and then the driver, Henry Paul, is fleeing the paparazzi in Paris, and they crash in an underpass. Doty and Henry Paul die at the scene. Diana dies a few hours later in the hospital from her injuries. Diana's bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, the only survivor, he suffered uh, severe brain and chest injuries. Every bone in his face was broken. A lot of reconstructive surgery. He spent 10 days in a coma. Surgeons would use 150 pieces of titanium to rebuild his smashed face using family photos as a guide. After the crash, he ends up bouncing around in jobs, uh, you know, job to job after recovering from his injuries. Eventually he gets back into security. He currently works as the global head of security for vaccine giant AstraZeneca. The tinfoil hat crowd has taken notice of that. Uh, the Illuminati moved him into another one of their companies after he helped assassinate Lady Di. Conspiracies regarding his involvement uh, in her death have never totally gone away. Uh, so tragic, Diana would have been going home the next day to see her children. The paparazzi chased the car she was in as they headed out to dinner. Uh, you know, because of this, Dodie canceled their original dinner plans, said they'll just eat dinner at the Ritz Hotel now, then drive to his apartment in Paris. Dodie's plan to keep everything private was to have two cars act as decoys, leaving the Ritz from the front entrance, then they would leave from the rear. So he calls in Henry Paul, who was off duty at the time and had been drinking. Of course, he had it was a Saturday night. Dodie and Diana leave the Ritz at 12, 18 a.m. Sunday morning. The paparazzi finds them, starts chasing their car. As they approach the uh, uh, Place de Alma underpass, Henry Paul clips another car, loses control of the vehicle, then hits the 13th pillar with no time to break. Dodie and Henry Paul die instantly. Diana's bodyguard, as I state, severely injured. Diana slumped over in the back seat, taken to the hospital where she'll die from cardiac arrest. Also, her pulmonary vein was torn. Would have taken a miracle for those doctors to save her. She died at a nearby hospital after two hours of emergency surgery, pronounced dead at 4 a.m. local time. No one in the car wearing seatbelts. An inquest later ruled that they might have all survived. Likely, most of them would have survived if they had been wearing seatbelts. I'm not sure how conspiracy theorists address the seatbelt situation here. Right, that should have helped quell assassination rumors. They died in large part from just not buckling up. That'd be a weird thing for an assassin to factor into his assassination plans, to count on them not wearing their seatbelts when they wrecked the car. And the one guy who lived, he also wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Um, you know, it's but it's, so it's not like you know he would have just reached over and jerked the wheel to wreck the car, like some have claimed. You know, because he's he's gonna probably die too. Uh, Four forty one a.m. The Press Association issues a news flash: Diana, Princess of Wales, has died, according to British sources. BBC newscaster Martin Lewis announces it at 5 a.m. Regular programming in England is suspended as coverage continues. The royal family gets the news while they're in Scotland at that hole-in-the-wall dump, right, Balmoral Castle. Within a few hours, Charles flies to Paris to travel with Diana's body back to England. He returns to Scotland to be with his children then. William is 15, Henry's uh, 12, or Harry's 12. Charles's main priority is to protect them from the paparazzi now. He asks the media to respect his children's privacy, let them have a normal school life. The public doesn't like the lack of emotion from the royal family in the days following Diana's death. All of Britain is devastated, and they wait for the palace to release a statement. Uh, they want the queen to lead Britain in mourning. Her normal style of being reserved and hands-off does not play well here, and she doesn't really step forward and do this. Prime Minister Tony Blair speaks before she does, telling the country, I feel like everyone else in this country today, utterly, devast utterly devastated. She was a wonderful and a warm human being. Through her own, though her own life was often sadly touched by tragedy, she touched the lives of so many others in Britain and throughout the world with joy and comfort. She was the people's princess, and that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. And that, yeah, it's a very good speech. Uh, September 1st, 1997, French investigators determined Henry, uh, Henry Paul's blood alcohol content level was three times over the French legal limit. No seatbelts in drunk driving. A combination that is fatal, you know, fairly often. No assassination needed with that. Earlier that day, Dodi Fayed's spokesman said that Paul was a sober model employee, and maybe he was, but, you know, he wasn't supposed to be working that night. Uh, Paul's family demands a second autopsy. It confirms, that the, uh, confirms the blood alcohol content and reveals he also had antidepressants in his system. So alcohol and anti antidepressants mingling together. That's not going to help his, uh, you know, reaction times, reflexes. September 2nd, 1997, people began placing flowers in front of Diana's home in Kensington at Kensington Palace. On September 5th, 1997, the queen makes a statement expressing her grief on live television now. She addresses her subjects as a queen and a grandmother, remarking on Diana as an exceptional and gifted human being. The royal family then returned to London uh, and, and viewed some flowers left for Diana. They flew the British flag at half-mast over the palace. Diana's death allowed them to present a united front, and the public generally approved of how they handled it now. On September 6th, 1997, Diana's funeral procession leaves Kensington Palace at 9.08 a.m. Her coffin rests on a carriage drawn by six black horses 
thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands lined the streets to watch. 2.5 billion people watched around the world. That's what they say, 2.5 billion. The Earth's population at the time, 5.8 billion. Almost half of everyone on fucking Earth tunes into her funeral procession. That's insane to me. Interesting personal connection to all this. I showed up in London just a few days later to study abroad there for a semester. And it did feel like a nation in mourning. I mean, people weren't crying in the street, but there were flowers all over, you know, various landmarks. Because I was like, what the hell is with all these flowers? I remember I, I, I was so oblivious in my own little bubble. I was like, what's going on with all these flowers? And then someone's like, well, yeah, because lady died. And I was like, okay. I didn't, understand, I didn't understand like truly how popular she was. Very somber overall atmosphere. Uh, the closest thing I, I've ever experienced in the U.S. to this as far as mass grief was the days following 9-11. I imagine the national atmosphere in the days following Kennedy's assassination, similar to what it was like in England in early September 1960, or 1997. On top of the flowers of her, on her coffin was a white envelope with the word mummy written on it. So fucking sad. Her sons put it there. Much to the public surprise, William and Harry walked behind the casket with Charles, Earl Spencer, Prince Philip, and some representatives of Diana's charities. Prince Philip, the boy's grandfather, had told him they might regret it later if they chose not to walk with their mother. And that's a good call, I think. At the funeral, the queen bowed to pay tribute. People were surprised. Historian Jane Ridley said the queen bows to nobody ever. And yet, as the funeral procession rode past Buckingham Palace, the queen was seen out front making a bow to her daughter-in-law. How magnanimous of her! She's not a bad person. She bowed. Everyone saw it. Long live the queen! Hip, hip, hooray! She can bow! Uh, at the funeral, Diana's brother gives a touching speech about her. Elton John performs a special rendition of his song, Candle in the Wind, changes the lyrics. It was originally about Marilyn Monroe. Uh, you know, now changes it to be fitting for Diana. The opening lyrics are, Goodbye, England's Rose. May you ever grow in our hearts. You were the grace that placed itself where lives were torn apart. You called out to our country and you whispered to those in pain. Now you belong to heaven and the stars spell out your name. This recording went on to become the most successful pop single in history. Sold over 30 million copies. Uh, Diana was buried at a gravesite on a small island at her family's estate. And then conspiracies began to swirl and swirl. Numerous official inquiries would determine that the crash uh, you know, was because of drunk driving and no seatbelts and because of evading the paparazzi, not because of some crazy conspiracy. Eight years later, April 9th, 2005, Prince Charles and Camilla finally marry in a quiet ceremony. She takes on the title of Duchess of Cornwall, and surprisingly, the public accepts her. I think they understood how fucking complicated and just fucked up the whole situation was. How Charles never wanted to marry Diana in the first place, not really. How Queen Elizabeth had been a thorn in the side of Diana, Charles, and Camilla. All right, let's hop out of this timeline now and explore some conspiracies about what really happened. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. To this day, rumors persist that Diana's death was no accident. Many have believed, and some still believe, it was a planned assassination by the royal family. They cite uh, several reasons that the royals would allegedly want to kill Diana, almost all of which have been disproven by numerous investigations. The Daily Express, a British uh, daily tabloid, and Muhammad al-Fayed, uh, you know, Dodie's father were the main spreaders of the theory that the royal family helped, you know, plan this car crash. And in response, the Metropolitan Police launched Operation Paget. Took years, cost millions of pounds, only for the police to agree with the initial reports. Their investigation examined 175 different theories, determined none of them were true. Here are the nine main reasons and or clues conspiracy theorists point to regarding her motives, you know, uh, uh, regarding believing the royals had Diana killed. You know, the, number one is Diana was killed because she was pregnant with Dodi Fayyad's baby. Muhammad al-Fayyad was the guy who really pushed this one. He felt the royal family could not accept that an Egyptian Muslim could eventually be the stepfather of the future king of England. Rumors of her pregnancy were rampant before her death. On a holiday in France, a newspaper speculated that she was pregnant. Diana also made comments about a big surprise coming soon. However, the post-mortem exam found no signs of pregnancy. Her blood test revealed no pregnancy. Diana's close friends went on record to say that she had never mentioned anything about this to them. Never told them she thought she even might be pregnant. So, doubtful. Uh, Diana, uh, number two, Diana did believe at one point she was going to be killed by the establishment. So this fuels conspiracy rumors, right? Of course. Paul Burrell, her former butler, disclosed a letter that Diana gave him for safekeeping. It said, I fear my husband is going to kill me in an automobile accident. So that doesn't look good. At the time she wrote this letter, she was having car troubles. And she feared for her safety. And she was a very dramatic person. Uh, you know, based on a lot of other, you know, confessionals and her writings and stuff. And her, her bodyguard had recently died in an accident, you know, her former lover. She thought this was part of the conspiracy. And again, I'll admit this does not look good. But people worry about shit that is not true all the time. I'm one of them. Am I fucking crazy head? I have built up so many scenarios 
or so-and-so has it out for me. <laughs> Only to realize later, not the case at all. Uh, I made up a lot of stuff in my brain. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm crazy. And Diana, she was a little bit crazy too. Uh, the third uh, theory here, the paparazzi intentionally caused the car, uh, crash to cash in on the carnage, right? According to this theory, the paparazzi chased, pushed the car, causing it to crash into the pillar so they could get the death photos and then make millions. An investigation determined this is not true. This is a really stupid one, I think, because she was worth a lot more, in my opinion, to the tabloids in the long run, alive, right? Sure, her death gave them a lot to work with uh, in the short term, but had she lived and kept dating random dudes or married Doty or truly gotten pregnant, this would have given them way more gossip to keep running with. So many more stories to sell more tabloids. Overall, they would have gotten more mileage, made a lot more money. Number four, uh, Henry Paul intentionally crashed after getting paid to kill everyone else in the car. This is the, you know, the, the thought here is Henry was paid by someone probably in the royal family to kill Lady Diana. Believers think the reports that Paul was drunk or a lie to cover up the killing and that the police swapped his totally alive, just fine body with a dr drunk dead person so the toxicology report would be correct. And this is fucking crazy town. I mean, this can be possible, but if you're going to go this far, it's like, okay, then literally any preposterous theory uh, that anyone can come up with a decent imagination is possible. Uh, theory number five, my dad was hiding under the front seat somehow. And at the right moment, he grabbed Henry Paul's legs, caused them to swerve, uh, he swerved the car, crash after being paid by Queen Elizabeth to kill Dodie and Diana. Then my dad hid in the wreckage until the police placed the car in storage, snuck out, and then he casually flew back to Idaho. And I'll admit this one is very hard to believe at first. However, when I texted my dad and I asked him, I'm like, where were you exactly on the evening of August 30th going into early, you know, the early morning of August 31st, 1997? My dad texted back, what the hell are you talking about? Is this that stupid joke of yours about me being a serial killer? And I find that interesting that he would immediately jump to being a killer, to being a murderer. Well, I just wanted to know where the fuck he was. You know, that feels like the reaction of a very guilty person in my mind. Now, if I didn't have a lot of concerns over his ability to hide under the seat, I would say this happened. Moving on. Don't even worry about this one if you're a new listener. Uh, theory number six, Diana's car had been tampered with. Very doubtful, right? This was her concern earlier that she had, uh, you know, written about. Eyewitnesses did not report seeing any car problems prior to the crash at all. You know, the car seemed to be driving just fine before it crashed. Uh, number seven, a bright flash blinded Henry Paul, caused the crash. This is maybe the dumbest one to me. We talked about this one last week. This is one of the ones that uh, that alleged clone victim, Donnie Marshall, his crazy ass pointed to with some Illuminati assassination claims. And I went, and I went over last week how fucking stupid of an assassination this Tempest. I mean, I don't think shining a bright light into professional driver's eyes is just going to make them panic and just like, you know, veer off course. That's, that's out of some like poorly written action movie. And also other people would have seen this light and no one, you know, reported that they're like, oh my God, this crazy ass light is coming to the tunnel, blinding people. Uh, Diana's medical care is sabotaged. EMTs are paid off by the crown is the next theory. That these shady doctors allowed Diana to die by not treating her pop properly. Uh, this conspiracy started to catch on because French EMS and British EMS operate differently. The French focus on treating at the scene while the British want to get people to the hospital as soon as possible. The investigators who wrote the report for o Operation Paget argued that a conspiracy like this would require a substantial number of doctors and caregivers to all break their oaths and be in on it. Some have speculated that it's possible that if she was taken sooner to the hospital, she might have survived. But doctors who were actually there, those who have studied her autopsy reports, say, mm, doubtful, probably not. And then there's theory nine. Dodie and Diana were never going out to dinner that night. Diana had stolen Queen Elizabeth's clit clip diamond, and she and Dodie were in the process of selling it to the KGB. The KGB wanted it because the 15 karat diamond was actually a key used to open a mystical portal that led to Queen Elizabeth's underground Illuminati cloning center. The one we talked about last week, the one where she stabbed Donnie Marshall or maybe his clone to write a new, you know, hit pop song. I may, I, okay, I may, I may, maybe I made that one up. I just, I just wanted to try and sneak the click clip uh, nonsense into there one more time. I think I'm done now. I'm done. Now, I think. Many of these theories have no evidence, of course, to back them up, but still a lot of people believe that Diana knew secrets about the royal family and they plotted to kill her because she was going to tell or they just couldn't stand that she was going to be married to someone who wasn't white. I don't know. How many times have we heard stuff like this, right? They, they, especially the know too much angle. They, they knew too much, so they had to be killed. I just think if that was true, wouldn't she have been killed earlier and more effectively? Poisoned in her sleep, maybe? I don't know. Made, made, made it, make it look like a heart attack or something? Why wait for her to start dating someone else, then just let them date for a while, then give the, her time to share secrets with him and secrets he could have shared with others? Like, if they're so worried about these secrets, wouldn't they want to kill her as soon as possible? It just makes no sense. The royal family, of course, denies having anything to do with her death. Other theories claim that the CIA, M15, M16, uh, the governments of other countries all wanted her dead for her work with removing landmines. But if that's true, that really backfired. 
right? She made that famous walk to an Angolan minefield in January of 1997. She dies in August. And then a few months later, the United Nations bans, bans landmines. And since the ban, uh, 164 nations have signed on. So if they were killing her because they didn't want her to raise landmine awareness to the point landmines would be banned, that really fucking backfired. And quickly. Uh, numerous theories claim that Charles wanted to marry Camilla and needed her dead, but no, he didn't. I mean, he, it pr he proved that, well, I, I'm sorry, he didn't prove that he didn't need her dead because he got married. I mean, but if if she wouldn't have died, I mean, they, they would have still got married. It just makes no sense. I Like, uh, I don't know. After all the Diana-related scandals, the queen relented and condoned Camilla's marriage to Charles. I don't know why she had to die for that to happen. Uh, there's never been any real strong evidence to support, you know, any of these theories. Diana's death was almost certainly caused by the paparazzi chasing her and Dodi Fayed choosing to ask Henry Paul to drive them even though he was drinking and on antidepressants. You know, her death was a tragic accident that could have been prevented if they were just wearing seatbelts. And her life was tragic in many ways. Born into such wealth and privilege and luxury, but it, man, it came at a price, didn't it? The fairy tale turned out to be more of a curse, a burden, and it led directly to her death. Had she not been fleeing from the paparazzi, she would have died that night. Oh, I'm sorry, she wouldn't have died that night. Dodie wouldn't have called another driver who was originally off that day, you know, to, to help them out. All that media coverage, man, would you want to be that famous? I would not. Every time you leave your house, you know there's a good chance someone is around, going to take your picture, waiting for you to mess up, maybe waiting to catch you with, you know, tears in your eyes and, you know, twist that into some scandal, uh, create some false narrative, you know, or maybe just catch you having like a bad hair day and just uh, put out an embarrassing picture. Camera's waiting to take a picture of you or some bad angle. So they can run a story about you putting on weight, put that on the tabloid covers. Camera's waiting to catch you at an angle that makes you look, you know, uh, too thin, run a story about your bulimia. Camera's waiting to catch you talking to a man who's not your husband, then run a story of a possible affair. It sounds like hell. I mean, she was on the cover of something damn near every day for years. Is being a princess and being able to live in giant mansions and castles on preposterously big, lavish estates worth never being able to just pop into a Starbucks, grab a coffee, maybe read a book? Never being able to just walk down the street, do some casual shopping uh, by yourself, you know, just to walk alone somewhere like that? You know, you can't ever just go meet friends at a, at a bar for a drink. You can't ever just, you know, go to a music festival, just randomly dance with a bunch of other people and join, you know, th themselves. There's so many things you don't get to do unless you're willing to be surrounded by bodyguards and constantly be photographed. No spontaneously popping into the movie theater because you suddenly feel the urge to watch whatever's new. No running off to the grocery store to grab a, you know, snack because you forgot something or meals for the week. Not unless you want to be fucking mobbed. So maybe, uh, maybe let the princess dream die. Maybe dream of being happy with the life you have. Maybe don't waste it thinking the grass is greener on the other side. The grass is not necessarily greener, even if it's the grass in front of, you know, uh, Balmoral Castle or Park House on Sandringham Estate or the grass in front of Kensington Palace. Diana lived such an envious life for so many. You know, that's really why people all over, uh, you know, read those tabloid stories about her. So aspirational, such a fantasy to live the life of a real princess, a beautiful princess, but she was fucking miserable. Sometimes dreams are best just left being dreams, aren't they? Let's head over to today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Diana was technically a commoner, but her life was far from normal. She was born into extreme wealth. Her family status elevated when her father became an earl. Diana grew up playing with Charles's, you know, siblings, and her family had royal ties dating back several centuries. She was the perfect candidate to be a royal bride. Number two, Diana was unhappy from the beginning of her relationship with Charles, and it only got worse as time went on. The stress of being in the spotlight triggered Diana into developing severe bulimia. She suffered from postpartum depression, anxiety, self-harm, even attempted to commit suicide by throwing herself down the stairs. Number three, both Diana and Charles had affairs during their marriage. Charles's affair with Camilla has been widely covered and talked about, but Diana also had an affair with her riding instructor, Captain James Hewitt, and her bodyguard, Barry Manneke. Their affair lasted five years. Diana was in love with him. She and Charles both accepted equal responsibility for the failure of their marriage. Number four, there are many conspiracy theories about the car crash that killed Diana, but almost all of them have zero evidence to support them. Eliminating a pregnancy the royals didn't want is the main one, but there are over a hundred conspiracy theory variations surrounding Diana's death. In reality, the car crash she died from was almost certainly a tragic accident brought about by a bad combination of paparazzi harassment, drunk driving, drunk driving and not wearing a seatbelt. And maybe my dad. Number five, new info. Ever since Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding on May 19th, 2018, People have noticed Megan's uh, similarities to Diana. Specifically, her tell-all interview with Oprah has been compared to Diana's 1995 BBC interview. In her Oprah interview, uh, Megan tells uh, details how the 
royal family mistreated her and even makes allegations of racism directed at herself and her son, Archie. And the way she acts in public to her rule breaking and willingness to be honest about the realities of getting involved with the royal, uh, Meghan is eerily similar to Diana. But unlike Diana, she took her possible future king and they got the fuck out of that tabloid hell. With attention on them waning a bit more as time goes on, I hope they are so, so glad they did get out. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The tale of Princess Diana has been sucked. Fun excursion into a new kind of story, for me at least. I hope you enjoyed it too. Uh, I am... I am I had a lot of thoughts about the royals, and I was like, I feel like th th they don't really have a lot of power. Uh, not so sure about these things, and it was good to kind of confirm some things and learn some new things. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help in making Time Suck this week and every week. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Olivia Lee for doing all the initial digging into this week's research, uh, Bidelixer for continuing to refine the Time Suck app, Logan Art Warlock Keith running badmagicmerch.com, uh, the visual artist for all things Bad Magic, our, our creative director here, uh, working on our socials, uh, socials along with Liz the Enchantress Hernandez. Liz runs our Cult of the Curious Facebook private page, currently Cult of the Curious 2, along with her wonderful All Seeing Eyes moderators. Uh, thank you for helping curate an awesome online community. Dear Meat Sack Liston, thanks also to Beefsteak and the Mod Squad running Discord. You can link to the Discord group through the Time Suck app. Uh, next week, the Space Wizards have spoken. And they have voted in the topic of Robin Williams. Back-to-back -back bio sucks. And neither one of them were murderers. Have we lost our way? No. The suck has always bounced around. We'll, we'll be back to darkness the week after that. Serial, color will, serial killer will be coming up next. But, the, but first, our first stand-up comic, other than me. Uh, what a story Robin Williams' life is. He spent 36 years in showbiz. Made over 100 movies. During that time, he won damn near every award he could win. He came to us as an alien. Mork and Mindy left as a true icon. Uh, he brought so much joy to so many. He was uh, also accused of being a joke thief by a number of comics. And like so many of his era, drug, uh, drugs and alcohol would become a problem, including taking the life of his friend, SNL comedian John Belushi, just hours after they partied together. Uh, starting as a lonely rich kid that attended six schools in eight years to getting selected as one of two full scholarship future thespians to Juilliard, to rising to worldwide acclaim in every field he tried, there was nothing ordinary about Robin Williams' life. He seemed to have so much energy. How? He was also prone to depression. What haunted him? Why did he take his own life? It wasn't until after his autopsy that the depth of his suffering was revealed. In recent years, efforts have been made to tell the true Robin Williams story with hopes to spread awareness about Louis body dementia, the fucking nightmare of a brain disease that he suffered from, and help rally funding to research more aggressively towards a cure. Robin was born with a mind able to accomplish so much, but in a twist of the darkest irony, that same mind would betray him in the end. Robin's story is one to be celebrated, and celebrate we will while also digging into some dirt next Monday on Time Suck. Now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. Love this first update. Concern and then comedy. Coming in from Wood Love and Sack, Bo Morin. Bo writes, Hi Dan and the Suck team, I just became a space lizard and an Annabelle. I've been listening to both podcasts for several months now, and to be honest, I was pretty hesitant to give you a chance. I emailed back and forth with Lindsay about this for a second after I fell in love with STD, but I think it's worth stating again. I was pretty skeptical that as a trans person, your podcast would be a good space for me. Luckily, my love for ghost stories outweighed my fear, and I finally gave STD a shot. I was truly impressed by the bias awareness that you display and by the balance of your perspective, and pretty much haven't stopped recommending STD and Time Suck ever since. Anyways, I figured now is a good time to start throwing some money your way for a couple reasons. One, podcasts are my primary form of entertainment and honestly information, so it's worth paying creators for their work and research. And two, at least partially thanks to the example you uh, lead and the examples of a lot of other suckers who have written in, I'm gearing up for a career change. I've been a hobby woodworker for a couple years and recently enrolled in carpentry construction courses to pursue it as a career that might make me happier than my current desk job. So, you know, I might not have extra money to throw at a podcast for much longer, but hopefully I'll be a lot happier. Thanks for everything, Bo. Bo, I love your approach to your new career. Right, trying to uh, monetize what you're passionate about. You have a desk job, but you're taking classes. You know, you're sneaking in the right way. I think learning how to do it right before you jump in. I think you're going to do very well in construction because even before the labor shortage, there was a construction worker shortage in a lot of markets around the country. So much work uh, here in Coeur d'Alene, one of many cities where there's a lot, a lot of need. Holy shit! Contractors around here, many of them, from what I understand, have never had this much work. So fucking get it, get that sweet sweet wood. And yeah, I don't care if you're at all if you're trans. Dick, pussy, doesn't matter. 
What matters is what's in your head because what's in your head is what's in your heart and that's who you really are. The rest is just a uh, set decoration, isn't it? That being said, I hope you're happy with your set deck. Hope you have either uh, a nice hard deck to jerk or a nice wet pussy to diddle, right? I hope you have a nice uh, clip clip with a fucking diamond like Queen Elizabeth does. You should write Queen Elizabeth and ask her, hey, what size is your clip clip diamond again? If you, if you, if you have, I didn't, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, there was no gender reference in the, in the, in the message. So, or, you know, or you could get, uh, you could, you could have it on a Prince Albert. You can have a, you can have a diamond on a Prince Albert, whatever you want. Live it up, you beautiful bastard. Hail Nimrod and hail Lucifer to you and appreciate the support. Very kind of you. Uh, now let's talk about the law. Uh, law, ain't no law dog around here. Ain't no law around here, law dog. Uh, let's talk about Cummins Law. Sweet reptilian. Kirsten Killy writes, I Cummins lawed my husband. My first time writing in loyal lurker lizard, Kirsten or Kirsten. God damn it. I don't know. It's K-I-R. I think it's, ah, it's Kirsten. I'm gonna say Kirsten. On the story of how I Cummins lawed my husband, I've been listening long enough to know better. I don't listen in my car. When I do listen at work, it's through Bluetooth headphones and I make sure the volume is turned all the way down on my phone in case something happens to my headphones. This incident was not from playing the podcast, but from talking about it loudly. My husband works on the network side of telecom. So he gets to go into the data centers that house all the boxes that the internet goes through. They're, they are bare bones office buildings with this stuff inside. I, that's, I found that fascinating. That's like some matrix shit to me. Uh, yesterday, he lost his keys at this building. So we went in after dinner today to go look for him. It was about 8.30 at night. We assume no one else was there. While he's looking for his keys, I'm following him around, talking to him about the Jody Arias episode. He's not a sucker, but he does enjoy listening to me tell him distilled versions of what he learned of what I've learned that week. So we walk into a back storage room with, a, with ceiling high shelves. I'm currently at the part about the photos of Jody's loophole that were recovered from the camera. That's when we hear from the next row over, hey, I'm in here. My husband startled, gets startled. We look over, see a coworker of his on a laptop going through the inventory on, the, on that shelf. Thankfully, the coworker also has a dirty sense of humor, but I'm sure it was still weird to hear someone walk in talking about photos of buttholes. <laughs> We all had a good laugh, so no harm done. And proof that you don't have to have the podcast on to be a victim of the dreaded Cummins Law. Stay awesome, give Bojangles a bone, and keep on sucking, Kirsten Killy. Uh, love it, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, dangerous to listen to this sh uh, show out in public, and also dangerous to talk about it out in public. You know, people don't understand if you're talking about stuff like, you know, Queen Elizabeth's, uh, you know, diamond-encrusted click clip. Uh, thanks for sharing your poop hole loophole story. I hope you still talk about poop hole loophole in private. Real quick message now. My wife, Lizzie's cousin, Tony, Put in a shout out request when you're in Cleveland the other week. Maria Fellenstein, I hope you're listening. Tony Carino, put in a nice word for you. He knows you're a big fan. Uh, thanks for being a fan for me as well. And now a thanks for supporting the service industry message from super sucker David Satram. I love this. David writes, Bad Magic Team, thank you so much for your recent support of the service industry. As you can see, I'm messaging you from my work account. Tijuana Flats is a Tex-Mex chain in Florida. Hopefully one day when you take a vacation down here, you will check us out. Come check out the Florida Man stories for yourself. Plus, the beaches are amazing. I'm 36 years old. I've been with Flats for 17 years. We barely survived the pandemic, which is one bank in the entire U.S. willing to give us the $10 million we needed to keep our 120-plus restaurants open. We had to close 12 restaurants, but they were money death pits. Anyway, the company is crushing it right now. The demand for tacos is high. However, as you have pointed out, all of the employees are gone. Also, this new variant of COVID combined with the state going no mask at the absolute worst time created new obstacles I never had to deal with before, even early in the pandemic. Back in late June, I worked 99 hours in one week as a manager at my locations. While we struggled to stay open with all three managers at one location going out with COVID at almost the exact same time. You talking about the GM of the comedy club running around and busting tables actually made me feel better. Point is, I just wanted to say thank you for your support and trying to stay and trying to calm down all the Karens out there leaving their one-star reviews. As part of my job is to respond to every guest inquiry or one-star review. Also, wasn't sure if I should write to Time Suck, Is We Dumb, or Scared to Death because I think you've said something on all three podcasts. Thanks also for getting me through my drives in between restaurants. If by some chance you read this, I think it should be okay if you say the company's name. <laughs> As P.T. Barnum taught me, any publicity is good publicity. Not sorry for the long email. Three out of five stars. Much love, David Satram. Tijuana Flat, South Florida supervisor. David, way to keep busting your fucking ass, man. 99 hours in one week. That is no joke. I salute you, man. Much respect. That is some champion shit. Uh, I love it. I spoke specifically about taking it easy on servers and small businesses right now on Yelp due to all the shit you're dealing with. Mostly, I think, on Is We Dumb, uh, the show with Joe Paisley. You should listen to it if you haven't yet. Uh, but I did touch on it uh, on all three podcasts, I think. Yeah, things continue to be really hard on the service industry right now. I mean, things things went from uh, you know people not being able to work to not having any customers, uh, often losing jobs, 
to those who do have jobs right now in the service industry, doing the work of like three, four people at a lot of places. So please, if you're frustrated with service somewhere, pay attention to what really what's really going on, right? Really trying to evaluate the real story there. If they're clearly running around trying to do their best and, and your you know, the takeout order is delayed, calm the fuck down. Right? If they're clearly short staffed, you know, they're burnout and exhausted, cut them some slack. It's so fucking hard right now for them. Be patient, be extra kind. A lot of people dealing with a lot of extra shit right now. And, you know, delayed service, some service, a lot better than no service, right? And a lot of Karens out there trying to, you know, one, uh, I'll, I'll say the male version of Karens like a Chad. A lot of Karens and Chads trying to one star places uh, into oblivion right now that is so selfish and just stupid and short sighted. Also, if you're in Florida, Go eat some of David's sweet ass tacos. I love tacos. Now I'm hungry. Uh, thank you for the messages, everyone. Um, hope you hope you enjoyed hearing them. And I don't I don't even know what I'm talking about now. I'm just trying to find. I'm gonna push this button. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. I, I had some bigger wrap up for that section of my head, and then it was just not there. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic uh, Productions podcast. Meet Zach. Please do not marry a prince this week if you know he's fucking someone else. And don't put up with Queen Elizabeth's bullshit. That's the one thing I want you to take away from this week. If Queen Elizabeth is giving you some shit, don't fucking take it. She has no real power. All right? Like, stop it. Get away, get away from me. If Queen Elizabeth is following you around hassling you, just be like, fucking go and get. Or just walk faster. She's 95. She's slow. And keep on sucking. <laughs> Bad Magic Productions.